Bravely Second is a confused mess that tries to be everything and fails at most of it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. It's a video game. The North America release was a little bit after my birthday in 2016, and I had enjoyed Bravely Default, the bafflingly named retro-inspired turn-based JRPG this was a direct sequel to, so I almost felt obligated by the spheres to go buy it, and I did. Chances are that if you're even watching this, you're already familiar with video games generally, JRPGs in particular, and my own sensibilities about overanalyzing things. But I'm going to formulate all this as if that's not the case, and you can test me at the end if for some reason you had no idea what any of this shit was, and you either did or did not apprehend it by the time I've finally stopped. I'm also going to be interweaving points about the first game throughout this only means my generation has of communicating with one another, most of which will only make sense if you have a bit of knowledge about what it was and how it worked. I'm going to try to provide that here, so if you already know about Bravely Default, you can skip to here about. Capiche? Bravely Default is a turn-based JRPG for the 3DS from 2012. North America release was early 2014. In addition to planning turns around the actions of four characters, the player can take extra turns in advance by using Brave, or raise defenses and build up turns for later using Default, hence the name of the game, despite the fact that those definitions make little sense in any descriptive or thematic way, so Really, it's one senseless moniker used to justify the other in a wild e coyote lift your own butt kind of way. The game also features 24 character classes granted by asterisks and obtained by defeating asterisk wielders, each with 14 abilities that play around this space. Many of these classes are easily identifiable as direct descendants of classes from Four Warriors of Light, or going even further back, Finals Fantasy V, III, and I which itself copied from D&D, so really we could keep going back forever, which I will not. The plot follows Agnes, the Vestal of Wind, guided by Eri, the Christ Fairy, on a journey to restore the natural order by communing with the now ailing Four Crystals, powerful magical artifacts whose safekeeping is the basic duty of the Crystal Orthodoxy, the religious sect of which Agnes is aligned. Without the blessing of the crystals, the air stills, the ocean rots, fires burn out of control, and the earth? The earth crystal, you see, is in the hands of our bad guys, the Duchy of Eternia, who use their airships to hector Agnes at every turn and try to prevent her from activating the crystals and thereby weakening the political weight of the anti-crystalist movement that their leader, Brave Lee, used to overthrow the previous government of his realm, install himself as Grand Marshal, and establish a system of universal healthcare for all the citizens of Eternia by drawing power from the Earth Crystal. This also brings an end to a plague that was going on. Agnes gathers Tiz Aurier, Ringabel, and Idia Lee. Much of this plot carries the DNA of those aforementioned games, you could say ripped off if you felt like being particularly uncharitable to Bravely Default, or if you just love Final Fantasy V so much. But it basically works here. Vestal and crew outmaneuver the duchy across four continents and finally assault Eternia directly and awaken the final crystal. The Holy Pillar appears, and a holocaust of light consumes all perception. The team awakens in the town where it all began, only to have apparently traveled back in time. The crystals are back to their ailing state, defeated enemies are alive and wrecking havoc again, and no one remembers what the party had done before except for themselves and whoever had written the mysterious journal Ringabel carries. This happens up to two more times, with the only changes on successive loops being that at one point, the great sage of Yolyana Woods slash archetypical perverted grandpa isolates Agnes and Tiz from Eri at one point to tell them straight up, do not trust that fairy. And other than that, the asterisk wielders from before start attacking two, three, and finally four at a time. After finally 
getting past all that. The party learns that the Holy Pillar is a portal between worlds, and that no one had time traveled at all, but merely been transported between numbered worlds in the multiverse. Eri was evil all along, serving an archdemon called Ouroboros, whose goal was to link all worlds with the Holy Pillar and then, I don't know, eat them or something. The party kills Ouroboros and closes the Holy Pillar, returning to some place and putting the whole thing to rest. It takes a particular flavor of suspension of disbelief to enjoy JRPG plots, which both ask you to follow along with increasingly wild cosmological constructions and also give you a happy ending where the heroes just win and everything is good now. So, what did the sequel title do to riff on the first game and maybe work on the flaws or improve the experience? Deep down, mechanically, a little, you know, some. Brave points and default states still work the same way, many of the same abilities appear, albeit handed off to new classes, there's an entire network of side quests whose purpose is to give you an asterisk from the first game, the battles against first game asterisk holders even have the same background music and arena as before, summoning friends is still a thing, street passing is still a thing, Narende is there once again but it's the moon now, a lot of monster models are reused, Idia still curses Mr. McGregor under her breath when she's angry. You traverse many of the same locations, often with the same backgrounds and level maps. Certain NPCs make a cameo. The adventurer and companion fox are still there. You can fight them in their super boss form again. You still have to scour the earth for summons, and the way you earn those is much the same, and so on and so on. It is very much a sequel in the sense of this thing but more, rather than this thing but different. There are a lot of subtle improvements, too. The classes now have just one icon instead of having one for putting the class on and another one for the ability set. The new icons for abilities more clearly identify them as being actions, spells, effects, and passives. The language of what abilities do now show the actual formulas involved. Trimming down on the number of abilities per class means that all the fluffier, more useless abilities are gone. Classes in general better fill useful combat roles in themselves, which makes for better challenge runs like a fiesta. You no longer have to unlock extra passive slots by communing with crystals. The walk speed on the world map is roughly doubled. There's a diegetic explanation offered for why the encounter rate slider exists, though I don't think that's actually a good thing, mind you. Many of the darker elements of the plot of the first game are softened or removed. From what we've heard, he hasn't been around here in quite some time. The auto battle system allows you to set up several different plans and option select rather than flat repeating last input. When you scan a monster to reveal their health bar, that now stays scanned for all monsters of that type instead of having to either do it for every monster in every fight or just remembering HP values using a legal pad. Special moves all have customizable trigger conditions rather than having that locked to weapon type. I'm looking at you, use five items to unlock knife specials. Even the way the combat menu works has more options to it. See, in Bravely Second, you can go to the action you want to take and from there control how many times you want to perform it and the game will set up the brave turns for you. Whereas in Bravely Default, you have to hit brave four times and then plan each action even if they are all the same. Overall, lots of good little changes that I expect would have happened in the first game if they had had more time to develop it. Now, by no means do I think this is a lazy cash grab attempting to capitalize on the success of the first game. There's just too much new and good stuff in there for me to think that. 
Also, <laughs> Lightning did not strike twice here. I've taken a passing glance at the sales numbers, which are basically like the first game but less, and from my own experience, no one was talking about this game. The first I heard about it was someone telling me it had come out. So we drove to the GameStop and purchased it. I had a 3DS left over from a debacle where my girlfriend had asked for a new 3DS for her birthday, and instead of purchasing a new 3DS, which was a thing, I had purchased a 3DS that was new, you see. Imagine my embarrassment. Okay, now stop imagining it. Nevertheless, to try to make hay from straw, I decided buying a 3DS game was a fine thing to do. It did seem like I was the only one playing the game. That summer, I spent most of a plane ride soaked in dog piss and playing Bravely Second, which is supposed to be what this is about, and I kind of got lost there a little. But that is what it was like, both as a game and as a moment. No one was talking about this like with the first. There were long gaps in my own playthrough because I would just get full up on it and stop caring. Another month passes and I find myself on a bus or train, and it makes sense to open it up again. And honestly, I do think the thing is worth more than that, but everyone I talked to who had played it had a similar experience. Something like, I got it because I liked the first game, but I just got bored of it and did not finish. So, why is that? Well... My own excitement for the prospect of another entry in the series was about a couple three things. I did want a this but more out of it. I wanted to see some obvious flaws in the first short up, and I wanted some major balance adjustments. And so my three wishes were granted in the most cursed way imaginable. Bravely Second delivered on this but more. More asterisks, more cutscenes, more enemies. We got more verbal ticks in place of characterization. We got an evil fairy. We got a psychedelic space monsters with disco balls for eyes. We got Chompcraft. You want battles? Well, how about chain battles with scaling rewards? You want microtransactions? We got those too. Along with a cute portrait of our little gremlins in various sport clothes. Quick pause on that. The first game also had the microtransaction for SP thing, but all the cutesy portraits depicted the gremlins in poses evocative of enjoying alcoholic beverages in modern Japanese imagery, and honestly, I think the tonal shift from SP as beer to SP as sports drink is a subtle and good one, though it carries with it the weight of momentarily presenting Idiot or Magnolia as pinup girl posters, so, you know, I take the good with the bad on this one. For the most part, this all felt like simultaneously too much and not enough. There are more moving parts than a functional game experience really needs, but all of them feel individually underdeveloped and a little bit at war with each other. Which would mesh neatly with the game's plot if such a mutual reinforcement were to the game's benefit in any way. The game is about a young knight's journey to rescue the Pope from a stock Saturday morning cartoon villain's flying fortress until it becomes about legacies of high house infighting and personal betrayal, until it becomes about getting the band back together, or uniting with moon people to fight kaiju from outer space, or a budding love story slash romantic comedy incited by culture shock, or the history of an ancient time wizard who invented all technology and even transplanted his soul to the body of a hero who now searches for his lost love and compares situations to produce, or it's about Idia's journey to adulthood, learning to make hard choices and prepare to take over as Grand Marshal of Eternia. Or is it really about brotherhood and betrayal again? Or no, wait, actually it's about the fairy. Oh no, I mean, actually it's about defeating a trickster god and collecting the power of devils? And so on and so on. Now, a story of epic proportions can have all of these elements and still work, as long as there is a uniting throughline. Maybe a single character whose reactions to all these things gradually builds a sense of who they are, especially in the face of long suffering. Maybe it is a location that stands in place like a passive god, stoically observing the manifold activities of the short-lived mortals whose lives play out in front of it. 
maybe it's unfair of me to compare a recent-ish video game to beloved old art. Okay, maybe it is the tragedy of an otherworldly power that across generations manifests itself again and again until it is finally destroyed. There's plenty of ways to do this, and Bravely Second does precisely none of them. The story is a scatterbrained mess that cannot wait to interrupt itself in both small and large ways. I'm going to interrupt myself here in a large way and start going through the game chapter by chapter from the beginning. Blammo, the bad guy is here. Do you remember that old game and its crusty old jobs? Well, this new guy is here to swat all that aside. He's fresh, he's tough, he's hiked his pants up to his cravat. Anyway, he cleans house and kidnaps Agnes, she's the Pope now, and steals off in his flying fortress. This basically works. I appreciate the subtlety of having prestige glasses from the first game slapped out of the way by this new guy. I like that we begin in Medius Race without any establishing of particulars other than the name Kaiser Oblivion. Starting on action is good, even campy action. This scene blends the old and the new in an exciting way. High marks for the opening. Of course, things grind to a halt almost immediately. Who is this new fellow? Eugenie Olja becomes our main character, awakening from a near week-long sleep like Tiz at the start of Bravely Default. Yu is the leader of the Crystal Guard, who are basically Lux and Dark's version of the real-life Swiss Guard. Yu rallies his pals, John on guard the fencer, and Nikolai Nikolonikov the bishop. The three set out to rescue Pope Agnes. There's a tidbit of ludonarrative dissonance chirping out from the edges here that old timers in the world of JRPGs will feel right away. The cost of having the game's end boss show up first thing and wreak havoc is the instant feeling of uselessness to the young main character's first quest. Obviously, you and his buds will not be able to go beat the Kaiser. He just appeared out of nowhere and solo slapped three of the best fighters in the world out of the way with ease. If this were framed more like a prison break and less like a hero's journey, it might work a bit better. Jan and Nikolai even tell him as much outright, which, looking back on it, is kind of cute. You and company travel through a dark forest, and we learn about their quirks. You himself is a bookish doofus. He's gung-ho, but also skittish, and Jan in particular is quick to point out the contradiction. Jan is the sassy older brother type character. He's as quick to express irritation as he is quick with his sword. Depending on how done you are with characters like this, I could understand not liking Jan very much. Nikolai is the patient paternalistic figure. He repeats himself for emphasis, most of the time encouragement to action, and admonishment for foolhardiness. I think I would have found this supremely irritating if Nikolai weren't voiced by Jamieson Price. I was holding out hope the entire time that he would slide in and say, I know this is sudden, and hit me with some fast facts about booze. Dang, that was the only enjoyable part of Catherine. Whatever you think of these boys, they continue through the forest, encountering, gasp, a troll. Nikolai tutorializes a basic plan of attack, which is to block a big turn from the opponent and use the extra turns afterwards to counterattack. It's a blunt and direct tutorial for how the brave and default mechanics work, and it's frankly pretty nice to have that very early on and the usefulness shown rather than told. This troll will actually demolish you if you fail to block his hits, and I really appreciate that in the game. Lacking anything even remotely resembling a positive plan, Jan and Nikolai convince you to meet up with the forward contingent of the Crystal Guard that they had dispatched earlier whilst you slept off his near-death injuries. We meet Othar, the young recruit, who explains that they had only gotten as far as that troll. So, around here... The scale of things starts to feel a little bit off. Jan describes the Glan's Empire as having thousands, even tens of thousands of troops, and that the Crystal Guard lost 90% of their 200-some soldiers. From the perspective of the player, both of these numbers seem fictitiously high. I think the Empire's army number is an excuse to have them show up as random encounters peppered throughout the game, but even that leaves open the question of how a previously unknown empire localized within one flying fortress managed to come to be. But whatever, whatever. This is early on, plenty of game to go, 
We're in a tent in a forest, and the rest is backdrop. After making camp for the night, Yu is awakened suddenly and runs out to see what's happening. Jan and Nikolai are nowhere in sight. Ghosts of the fallen resembling our foot soldiers from before block your path, leaving open the way back into the forest, where screams of the dying reach you at his camp. Who is the mysterious attacker? Jan! It's Jan, actually. He explains that he's with Kaiser Oblivion now because it is useless to oppose him, so I have to take it back. The game does acknowledge that tidbit from before. He did seem awfully enthusiastic about killing all his teammates, though. I guess the willingness to betray was always bubbling under the surface, huh? There's even a piece of character theming in that Jan switches to a left-handed stance. First and foremost, this means the stage blocking allows Jan's body stance to be open and facing the player in battle scenes, but stances can accommodate a fair fencer. I'm willing to give them points for this neat detail. Agnes pipes up over magic pendant Skype and urges you to run away. You plunges off a cliff and lands at his lowest point, betrayed and cold and alone. He retreats to Gothelatio, where his butler, Alfred, Yes, I know. Informs him that the Empire struck here, too. Yu races to the Sanctum to hear Nikolai's dying declaration. Nikolai urges you to run and live to abandon this fruitless battle. Yu, of course, refuses. Yu returns to the forest, now with no friends and even less of a plan. He addresses the player directly for want of someone to talk to. A spooky doll materializes and taunts him. The wizard Bella appears the voice behind the creepy doll, and our first boss fight against an asterisk wielder begins. Yu is too spooked to fight, and Idia shows up to save the day like the girl boss she is. Bella moans plaintively, humiliated to have died in this manner. Idia explains why she showed up, amounting to, this oracle told me to come here and do this, which is pretty weak story-wise, but I have my theory as to why. She joyfully greets Agnes over the phone. Oh right, I should talk about the bottom screen. See, you has a magic pendant that functions as a continuous video phone call with Agnes. You can ask Agnes what to do next and get her opinion about things and also rub her face with the stylus and watch her react. Was that a thing? When was rubbing animes a thing? So much for all that. Idia shuffles us along north to Eternia, where she plops you in front of a huge buff grandpa who apparently read the stars and sent Idia off to find you in the first place. He gives them a quest to get the band together so the rest of the game can happen, and okay, pal, I get that if you're going to have a JRPG with exactly four characters, the sooner you get them all together, the better. But this is a pretty big lampshade. Also, it's a little weird that Yu doesn't recognize the man, and he goes unnamed until much later. This whole section is weak. Our duo then heads toward a tower where Tiz is locked in a magic water stasis tank, but must avoid the Glan's army, and takes a side road, stopping along the way at Gravemark Village, which Idia explains is a memorial to those lost to the plague. A rocket crash lands outside the shack where they're sleeping, and Yu finds a woman unconscious within. He uses a nearby magnolia flower to revive her, which she then adopts as her iconic accessory and even name, Magnolia Arch. She explains that she is from the moon and on a mission of vengeance against a fiend hiding within the enemy's flying fortress, so rather a lot to unpack here. Magnolia is charitably extremely forward. She immediately imprints on you, even changing her image and name to be mementos of their first meeting. She interweaves French with her speech, supposedly the language of the moon, but nakedly a characteristic meant to make her more, air quotes, romantic, a la Pepe Le Pew. She's busty and brash, is unfamiliar with the ways of Luxendark and thinks of you and every dorky thing he says as fascinating. Even her celebratory battle poses are salacious, even though I think it's more charming than anything else to take this art style and try for straightforward sexiness. It's pretty clear to me that her character concept started life as, what if we made Ring a Bell but a girl this time, and this introductory scene bears all that out. 
I recommend watching a YouTube video by pop culture detective called Born Sexy Yesterday because it's quite good, and because at this point, Magnolia is that to a TNA. Now, to be honest, I think this character dynamic works better than Ring a Bell did in the first game, but that might only be because I like to watch you squirm. Honestly, the whole damn video could be about Magnolia, but I talked myself into doing a Stake Bentley style, we're gonna talk about everything vid, and I really do like to hear myself talk. The trio continues on through the frozen hollows, where Dark Vestal Bella and Kuhulin the charioteer attack. Ku's whole character is yelling and fighting, and let me tell you, I am all about it. He just really loves battle. As the owner of the At Samurai eBooks Twitter account myself, I appreciate the aesthetic. Most of the time, the use of verbal tics as shorthand or substitute for characterization in anime is something I find lazy and irritating. But just listen to this guy. <laughs> Kuhulin is my name! A thousand weapons do I wield! Apart from my own love of characters who love battle, I think Kuhulin works because out of all the colorful cast of minions that Kaiser Oblivion sends to get murked by the adventuring party, Ku is the one that is the most honest about who and what he is. Down with tragic backstories. Up with battle centaurs. Victory in hand, the party continues to Eternian Central Command, which has been occupied by the Kaiser's rank and file troops. Two of them, Sergeant Sap and Private Piddler, try to add a bit of quirky levity by performing a half-baked straight man slash fool stand-up act. Maybe at some point along the line, the writers decided that having our bad guy be Doomer Alucard and having soldiers superficially aesthetically modeled after World War I era German armed forces was going a little overboard, so some levity was required. Well, thanks. I hate it. Remember in Final Fantasy VIII, where those two military jamokes kept coming back as boss fights, but every time they did, they had been busted down in rank because of their failure? Not only was that a cute touch, it was also a parallel to how, as Squeon, you could take exams from the menu and rise in rank. See how that works? You take a bit of minor theming from elsewhere in your story and riff on it in a way that the player experiences organically. Sap and Piddler are just irritating. Nevertheless, the party releases Tiz from his back to tank, and he's fine, if a little bit out of it. The sequence takes place in an AR cutscene, where Magnolia repeats some of her lines from before and actively flirts with the camera. This seems like a bit of a break from her previous character, in that she's flirting with Tiz instead of you, which is because this cutscene is straight up reused from a teaser at the end of Bravely Default. There's so many conflicting styles going on, it starts to feel like whiplash, so let's talk about how the story interrupts itself in small ways all the time. The story cuts between regular cutscenes, FMV cutscenes, this AR cutscene, gross, party chat, tent events, journal entries, narrated character introductions and overlays, and in-battle monologues and dialogues. Each of these styles has a consistent tone and presentation with itself, but they clash with each other and end up making every single scene about three times as long as it needs to be. This is what I'm talking about with the game feeling like both too much and not enough. Every individual micro scene is too small and short to do much in the way of story conveyance, the dearth of character expressions and gestures too little to convey any subtextual information, and taken all together, they are too at odds to build up to anything substantial. Okay, back to Tiz. Idia and Agnes are happy to see him. Yu seems to think of him as this legendary hero, which is a bit of a disconnect from the first game, but easily explained as Yu being a goober and Tiz just rolling with the punches. Our story so far has been a hasty push to get here because we had to make that AR cutscene make sense somehow, so honestly I was too relieved that we were finally at this point to beef too much about how bungled it was getting here. I mean, aside from all the beeves I've already taken, naturally. This is also our first opportunity to tussle with a boss as a full party, and Jan appears just in time to be that boss. 
Nikolai joins the fray, and you and crew defeat them both, but let them escape as you cannot bring himself to deliver the finishing blow to his former fellows. It's a little odd that the rest of the adventuring party have little to say to you about this turn of events, but then again, maybe it would be in poor taste to tell him, actually, we're your friends now, so it's okay to murder those guys. That might be a little off-putting, and I should really stop listening to people who tell me that when I need to migrate to new friend groups every four years or so. The, uh, narrator cuts in talking to someone we haven't met about things we didn't see, and we can finally move on to the next chapter. Oh, shit. That was the prologue? That whole thing? Oh, god. Wait, why is the intro cutscene playing again? This actually happens at the start of every single chapter, and it's always the same cutscene, and because a lot of... Okay, most of... Okay, all the chapter breaks feel sudden and arbitrary. It's a little shocking to have this full FMV hit you with blasting audio. It's honestly paced as if these chapters were episodes of an anime if those episodes were somehow two and a half hours long each. Kami Izumi vows to avenge Brave and puddle along to Idia's aid with his cat, Tsubaki. This scene serves only to set up two later scenes and is otherwise pretty weak. I think this is characteristic of most of the game's scenes, honestly. There's a whole heck of a lot of setup and payoff, but the setups are never anything more than that. It's a house built on no foundation, and it goes on for so long that you forget where it all came from originally. You and crew, now all assembled, head back to Gothladio. You finds and rallies the remainder of the Crystal Guard, which includes Othar from earlier. My best guess as to why the story bothers to have Othar around at all is to serve as a contrast for you. Othar is the younger and worse version of you that we keep around so you looks better. It's just as nonsensical here as it is in every story where it happens except Frasier, but at least here we pretty much do away with Othar after this, which is a relief since that mechanism is terrible and also baffling because you could just not have Othar there at all in the first place. Using Kami Izumi's shitty boat, the party paddles across the sea to chase the Skyhold. Along the way, an obnoxious child in a cat costume appears and Tubaki goes berserk, injuring Kami Izumi. We already know from an earlier scene in Bad Guy Town that she is Minette Napkati, the Catmancer Asterisk Holder. It's a shame that they didn't stick with Nekomancer, as that's actually a functional pun. It's not like they had to scrub out all the Japanese, either, unless you expect me to be familiar with Ikikasei as a regular loanword or something. Then again, the, the same writers use Infirmiaushin Superhighway, was, which was at least two decades out of date when the game released, never mind the Nyan Nyan talk. If you do choose to have a character in your VidCon use buzzwords from the 1990s, at least give them, like, a slap rap or some pogs. The crew makes it to Alcampus, the land of learning. Lacking a clue about where the Skyhold is, the party asks around town. It was here, but no one saw where it went. At an impasse, the four heroes get a little... sidetracked, shall we say. We encounter Pudgius Bismol, a five-star student and tone-deaf fat-shaming joke, exerting his rank over Rifa, a three-star. Rather than complicate the language of the game with real terms of academia, we have a star ranking system that denotes a strict hierarchy, and a fresh example of what that looks like in action, as well as intimations of nepotism and generational wealth tipping the scales of the system away from a meritocracy. It's honestly some of the most efficient storytelling in the whole game, even if it is cartoonishly blunt. In case you think the pointy hats with stars on them is too ridiculous sounding, I invite you to look up modern-day graduation robe sartorial standards. Suddenly a wizard hat doesn't seem so ridiculous. Nevertheless, Yu decides to use his own privilege to intercede on behalf of Arifa, which is good praxis and useful for reinforcing Yu as both a decent person and a colossal nerd. Rifa is overjoyed to have literally anyone stick up for her, which gets Magnolia acting all catty and possessive until she learns that Rifa is a ballologist, someone who studies balls. This gives them something to bond over, as Magnolia is a ball buster, a tongue-in-cheek expression for defeating monstrous kaiju from outer space. 
The moon, you see, is the first line of defense against these creatures who are repurposed bonus bosses from the first game you could encounter at will from Narende through the Nemesis system if you street passed with enough people. There is a mysterious crater where one landed not long ago, and Magnolia leads the charge to investigate. That is, if you didn't choose instead to get sidetracked with the first of the game's side scenarios. It's really a shame that the scene writing is at its most efficient here, because this is also where the overall plot shatters. The story interrupts itself in large ways by changing between the various recurring threads, with half-hearted attempts to tie them together after the fact with some offhand line about how, say, the Kaiser's Skyhold actually has a powerful ball in it that, that had created the impact crater. Every new task our gaggle of gremlins takes up as a quest seems barely related to the task before it, compounded by the fact that there is an entire system of side quests where the end is a trolley problem where your choice results in getting one of two classes from Bravely Default. Since these stories are entirely orthogonal to the main scenario, and because the reward of a new asterisk is perhaps the biggest the game has to offer, every chapter has two to three side stories that just plain interrupt the main one. Oh, and all of them are dumb and bad, by the way. The presentation of this system of side quests is that Idia steps in to resolve a conflict between two groups or ideas, which could be interesting as it on the surface presents moral conflicts as a division other than good slash evil. The problem is that instead of a proper dilemma, all of these conflicts have no consequences or have easy to imagine third answers that would neatly satisfy all parties that no one involved seems able to think up. This first one between Red Mage Fiore de Rosa and Jackal the Thief is about the closest we get to a real dilemma. De Rosa wants to use a magical water source to further research into a metaphor for nuclear power that would be sufficient to satisfy the needs of everyone on the planet, but experimenting with it could destroy a city. And the Jackal wants to use that water source to bring water back to the oasis where people are dying of thirst. This plays off of some of the characteristics we understand of these two from the first game. Jackal in Bravely Default is part of a scheme to restrict access to drinking water, and DeRosa is an experimenter and serial kidnapper. Here they are, repurposed, shall we say, and it isn't clear if these are the same people or duplicates from one of the multiverse worlds or whatever other colorful comic book nonsense explanation you care to come up with. It's not a bad idea in itself to try to introduce some nuance to player choice in the game, but it is important that these side scenarios reinforce or otherwise inform the main quest. But they don't do that in Bravely Second. For example, the side scenario in Bravely Default involving Jackal had the party gradually uncovering a vertical conspiracy, learning more about the governance of Anshime and tracing the corruption all the way to the top. It fleshed out Anshaim as a place, and demonstrated what Bedfellows the Duchy of Eternia was willing to stomach to defeat Crystallism, even while carrying out the tasks of securing the Wind Crystal and restoring the winds along with it. They reinforced one another. But here, just as the plot has stopped in its tracks and continues with what is a distraction, it introduces another different distraction that also does not inform the main scenario. If you're going to bring the plot to a screeching halt two to three times per chapter, at least make it worthwhile. Narratively worthwhile, I mean. The asterisk is worth plenty of whiles. What I mean is that frequent interruptions to a plot are forgivable if it's at the best of a steamy sex scene, for instance. But okay, okay. That ain't gonna happen here, even if we do get some steam later on. A bonus ripper is one of the few things Bravely Second is not trying to be. Wearing many hats is part of the DNA of the game, but most of those don't fit so well. The game is trying to be a sequel, and also do its own thing. Bravely Default textually presented the world of Luxendark as one in a chain of multiverses. In that game, what this means is the writers had free license to reuse characters who had been killed off earlier, or reimagine them, or give them cute extra scenarios while also ramping up the boss encounters to sometimes ludicrous difficulty. In Bravely Second, the whole multiverse thing is free license to fiddle with the facts about the world in a way that isn't technically contradictory to anything that happened before, while also letting in anything the writers happen to want to reuse. 
It's clever if you have a light touch with it. But this game ain't exactly subtle. Bravely Second wants you to recognize when they reuse a character or plot beat or whatever insofar as you get a little nostalgia hit. It works perfectly if you played the first game a long time ago and barely remember anything about it. Fiore de Rosa here is a perfect example. In Bravely Default, he's a research scientist perfecting his date rape drugs, which is more than enough for Idia to want to murder his ass. But here he's back, and he's a research scientist, and Idia sneers at him when they meet, but it's not clear that he ever did the whole serial date rape thing. Now, on one hand, I'm fine with the idea of removing some of the darker elements of a cutesy, nostalgia-driven JRPG. I think the whole chapter where DeRosa appears in the first game is gross and could use a big rewrite, but on the other hand, we're being asked to simultaneously remember and forget what happened in the first game because there's not enough presented in Bravely Second to form a full picture. So is this DeRosa a serial date rapist? Is he even from the same world as the rest of the party? Wait, which numbered multiverse world is this? Why is no one talking about the whole multiverse thing? That seemed really important. This is the kind of thing Bravely Second is not interested in answering or even acknowledging. Come to the colossal pillar of wasp eggs and do not bring weapons. Or, to put it in the context of a less than decade old meme, what the writers are saying is like, no take, only throw. I may as well put it bluntly because this game is also blunt as a bag of hammers. All art has something to say, and what this game has to say is, consume this and don't think about it too hard. And look how well that's going. Speaking of distractions and consuming things without thinking about them, around this time, this also happens. Let's talk about Chompcraft. Chompcraft is a variant of the idle clicker genre of game in which the four heroes assemble plushy chomps and sell cartons of the finished product for company script, which can eventually be exchanged at Chompshire for cash. Magnolia, with the scissors, determines how many chomps are produced in a cycle. Tiz, with the stuffing, affects the base selling price of each chomp. Idia, with the glue, sets the time to completion. And you, with the paintbrush, raises the rarity chance. Of the chomp. Chomp points can also be turned in for upgrades to each of these tools, allowing you to temporarily increase productivity in exchange for points. Each completed chomp also increases the snack time gauge, and once full, you can activate snack time, which plops a bunch of food in front of our gremlins and multiplies their productivity for a few seconds. It's a pretty mindless activity up until the point where you finally unlock all the upgrades, including maximum snack time. Then it becomes this. The idle part of our idle clicker is gone. The residuals of one snack time feed almost directly to the next, and failing to mash the sell button in time can result in a lost carton of chomps. It becomes hard to know when to stop because the remaining value of the temporary upgrades feed snack time which demands the upgrades get refreshed, and you are stuck in a purgatory of chompcraft. Egg cartons filled with dead-eyed and party-colored chomps, daring you to stop while demanding you continue. If you do ever manage to put the thing down, a session summary screen gives you stats, and different scores unlock background music tracks, which you can set as the BGM of your Chompcraft session. It's a fine little side activity when you don't feel like either beating up some chain battles or listening to these gremlins talk. It's also an attempt to solidify the Chomper as the game's mascot character, though I find it telling that the Bravely series' slime or moogle equivalent has a floor of being a huge pain in the ass to actually fight. Can you believe my first draft of the script didn't even have the word chomp in it? Madness. Back to chapter one. I almost wish this chapter fit into the rest of the game a lot better, because on its own, it's actually really cool. The descent into the ball crater is moody and ominous, making full use of the 3D effect on the top screen if you choose to put it on, but otherwise still providing a visually interesting and complex enough dungeon to dive ever deeper into. 
The sheer plains of glistening ice draw the eye deeper in, the promise of danger equal to the unnatural beauty of the place itself. Magnolia gets a call over wrist radio, where Vice President Appleberry, the moon's other inhabitant, I guess, informs her that yet another ball slipped past the moon's defenses and is heading her way. This is... a little baffling. See, I'm fine with people living on the moon and having starships and using modern radio protocol and all that, but why did we need a second ball? Why not have the upcoming boss fight be the one that made the crater, rather than referring to another one that did so and then got away to somewhere, and also have this one land in the exact same spot while the party is here investigating the first? There's just... There's no reason to do it up this way when a much more straightforward construction is sitting right there. Maybe this is a small nit in the grand scheme, but it sticks out to me because before I was looking back over game footage to write this, I had remembered that part wrong. There's one ball that ravaged Magnolia's home, crashed on Luxendark, causing the crater, and then later became the power source for the Skyhold. And then there's this one that lands on us right now so we can have a boss fight. At least it's a really cool one. Urchin is both a difficulty spike and a stylistic clash with previous encounters. Discordant strains play under children chanting. The psychedelic colors of the monster and silhouetted background all dare the viewer to make sense of it. In all likelihood, Urchin will also give you a proper beatdown, so learning beforehand that it's on its last legs is a bit of a tease. It's the first hint we get that there's something really big and really wrong with what we've seen so far, and I wish it weren't so shoehorned in. Once the party is back in Al Campus, Agnes calls them on the video phone and tells them the Skyhold has parked over Anjime. But before the party gets there, a massive sandstorm prevents them from accessing the city. An interview with Pudgeus informs them that Professor Norsen could probably help chase away to Rude. They slip in at night after an extended sequence of you expressing his fear of ghosts, which is odd, both in that we take so long laboring over this point where the solution is just walking into a building at night, and in that ghosts are real? Like, to advance this segment, you have to go outside of town and wait for nightfall. And if you don't want to just stand there, you will probably get into a random encounter. And each area has different encounters day and night. And around Al Campus, the usual suspects at nighttime include ghosts. It strains belief that the party shames you for his fear of ghosts and that in a world where ghosts are definitely real, kids still make up stories about fake ones to spook each other. Oh, and also Magnolia gasps when she sees a mouse, which is, you know, an ancient sexist stereotype. Honestly, using that of all things to try to flesh out her character is like eating acid to burn away the poison. We finally enter a room and meet Norzin who is actually the fortune teller and buff grandpa from before. How did you not recognize him? Oh, he just never had the honor. Norsen Horoskov is among the best of the asterisk wielders as far as characters go. Instead of a tragic backstory, he has one sentence about his hobbies. He expresses interest in things and takes steps to bring about change. He even has seven stars around his head, signifying his status within the university, which is a neat little detail. Do this more with your colorful cast of boss battles, please. Anyway, he explains that he, in fact, caused the sandstorm and plans to use it to destroy the Skyhold, along with Anjime and everyone in it. Deciding that they do not want to be party to mass murder, the team attacks him and earns the Astrologian Asterisk upon his defeat. He graciously monologues about how, actually, the Kaiser is looking for a MacGuffin called the Compass of Space and Time. Minette overhears and sicks a nearby cat on Norzen, killing him. He gets an all-too-lengthy cowboy death speech. There's an awkward scene after this of the party deciding what their common cause is so that, you know, we the audience don't have to worry about how fractious this chapter has been. Magnolia, in particular, says what amounts to, Yes, my mission was something else, but my boss also said go make some friends, and here I am. Too bad about this whole chapter being scattered all over, itself a demonstration of just how disconnected our aims are. This is a quintessential case of the showing being at odds with the telling. Now, 
If this is the party, and thus the writers apologizing to me specifically for being all scattershot and promising not to do it again, apology accepted. There's a MacGuffin to fetch now, and we're in it for the gravy. Back in Evil House, Minette reports to the Kaiser, who sends her, and then Jan also, to go fetch the MacGuffin. We next travel to the Harena Sea Caves, which look dope as hell, and have a gimmick of using crystals to raise and lower blocks to change the available paths. This cave makes greater use of the 3D space than pretty much any dungeon from the previous game, and random encounters haven't worn out their welcome by this point. I feel like things in that regard are still going pretty smooth, doubly so if you picked up Summoner. Oh hell, I forgot about Summoner Swordmaster. Okay, backing up. The supposed dilemma of the Summoner Swordmaster is about a mutual trainee of theirs, Go-Getter. He's currently toiling away on a literal treadmill at the administration offices of Ansheim, who gleefully reveal that they actually know he's more valuable than that, but are hazing him as a way to break his spirit and prevent him from realizing his own value. Menphilia Venus recognizes his natural talent as a summoner and wants him to quit his day job and join her in advancing their art. Kami Izumi fears his disciple will never grow as a person if he lacks the diligence to suffer unfair labor conditions on the way to fair ones, and the two find each other at odds. Now, the real answer to this dilemma would be for Idiot to sit out and tell this bloke to make up his own mind. There's something insidious about the presentation of this scenario in this way, where a young man early in his career lacks what it takes to make a definitive choice and would rather give up all agency over his future than come to his own conclusions. The end results also soften the blow of whatever consequences may have come of this, and the underlying problems of the cult of work go wholly unaddressed. If you side with the Swordmaster, Go ends up getting off the treadmill and advancing to a position more worthy of his training. If you side with the Summoner, he leaves toxic work environment and does whatever Minfilia is on about in the woods. He's happy either way. It's spineless writing. They got me all keyed up over a fantasy rendering of one of the ways in which unfair labor conditions in the real world come about, but then stop short of getting any meaningful commentary on what it means either about the society or to the individual. It's like being challenged to a duel by somebody you already wanted satisfaction from, and when the weapons chest opens there are two different kinds of pillows inside, and you know right then the form of honor will be satisfied without any of the substance. Ahem. Back to the Harena Sea Caves, with a new class in the pocket. After a bit of dungeon puzzling, the crew uncover the compass of space and time, which resembles a sword sticking out of a roulette wheel, but okay. Minette shows up to Nabbit, bringing with her Bismarck, a literal lion, and hinting at her tragic backstory. After her defeat, Minette tosses the compass to Jan and summons two regular house cats to keep the party at bay so Jan can escape. Then she dies. The party race back to Anshim and ascend the elaborated transverse gearbox called the Grand Mill Works. They even almost catch Jan, but he counterattacks with his tragic backstory. Anna the Fairy shows up and tells him to get on with it already, so he lets Amphis Bana loose on the party. Mechanically, this chapter has been a steady ramping up of boss fight power and complexity, and Amphis Bana is something of an end of chapter test. One of the heads absorbs all physical damage, and the other absorbs all magic. This ignores other modifiers as far as I can tell, so there's no real getting around it. It can roll to randomly swap places and keep you guessing, and one defeated head will regrow after a few turns. It's decently complex, and if you come at it trying to flush all your actions into one damage type, you will be ranched. Two things significantly soften the challenge. Using the Freelancer Examine ability or a magnifying glass to keep track of which head is which, and the wizard's hammer spellcraft to be able to hit as either magic or physical on one class. It's neat. I like it. Before the party can reach the skyhold, suppressing fire from across the ocean stops them in their tracks. We get a preview of next chapter's baddies, and the narrator chirps in with some prophecies addressing an unknown person. The audience? You? There is a real answer to this, by the way, but it's dumb and bad and comes way later, so bear with me for now. The crew once again ask Agnes for a clue about where in the world the Skyhold has gone. 
Ash from the fires of Mount Karka near Heart's Child are making her cough and tear up, so the team resolve to make it over there somehow. Not knowing how to get there with their shitty boat, they sleep on it. Yu can't sleep for the noise the other three are making murmuring about their collective dream, and he goes for a moonlight walk. This is the first time we hear the man with the purple pen speak, and he roundabout says to Yu, you can just use the boat you already have, the only obstacle is out of the way now, I promise, and is gone before he is seen. For someone who says words are like cabbages because you should weigh them carefully, he sure does lay waste to a lot of words, even more so than yours truly. Upon reaching the shack by the sea, they meet Yoko, a young princess adorned with fox motifs who liberally intones Japanese words and phrases and who all but begs to be taken along. She next clarifies that she could have done fine by herself, but lied about needing help because she wanted to come along anyway. Next, they catch her stealing food and the party admonish her for it. This all happens as you simply walk from place to place on the continent. It has nothing to do with our main plot, and as far as I can tell, the only reason any of these scenes exist is to give Yoko an excuse to express herself using the royal we, and thereby give the audience any idea of who she is or what she wants. I feel it's a bit of a missed opportunity that she's not a temporary battle partner like in some games like Final Fantasy XII, Final Fantasy Tactics A2 Grimoire of the Rift, Final Fantasy Legend 3, Earthbound, Tales of Berseria, Xenoblade, Pokemon Diamond Pearl and Pokemon Black White, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, or Bravely Second. At Eisen Bridge, the team meets Daniel Goodman, commander of the Shield Bearers, who recounts Idia's and Tiz's heroics in Chapter 3 of Bravely Default, albeit heavily abridged and somewhat edited. He also explains that a lone sniper is holding the bridge against the Shield Bearers. Meet Amy, bearer of the Hawkeye Asterisk. She's my cousin Vinny meets Harley Quinn, but with a cowboy hat and a gun that's also an axe. At her taunts, the invisible hand of toxic masculinity pushes some of the shield bearers to break the line and be killed. When the party try to confront Amy from across the bridge, she repels them easily, promising to murder them outright. It's a little refreshing to hear a character in a JRPG speak this way, given the long history of localizations that were super squeamish about including religious icons of any kind, mentions of God or Satan, or using words like kill, die, or murder. It's 2016 and the gloves are off. No more knocking down or rubbing out. No more swooned or fainted. She has a gun and guns are for killing. With Goodman injured, the team retreats from Amy's hail of bullets and sassy New Jersey accent to Hart's Child, where a mystery benefactor has sponsored a local festival that runs every night. If you need to quickly switch from daytime to nighttime to carry on with the plot, there's a dog in town which you can play with until nightfall. This is sadly a menu and not a minigame, but it is the best possible way to flavor that menu, so top marks for that. The team decides having a little fun at the festival is a welcome break from adventuring, and to the devil with the urgency of their task, which, you know, seems to me like neither hustling nor hurrying. Yoko is the second girl in as many chapters to make Magnolia jealous. I think Yoko and Rifa even share a voice actor. And Magnolia and Yu finally get some time alone. They momentarily gasp brush hands at the goldfish scooping game and are both overwhelmed with embarrassment. Yoko asks you to get her a flower at the stand, and he does so, with another for Magnolia. Magnolia, confused and devastated, apologizes profusely as her voice actor does her level best to emote Magnolia's heart dropping to her stomach. The voice work of Odin Sphere this ain't. If you want to hear the tackiest dialogue sold in the most skilled capacity, that's where you should look. Ideally, we would also have better dialogue to begin with, but, you know, video games. Magnolia explains to you that, on the moon, flowers are exceptionally rare and exclusively used as betrothal tokens, heavily implying that her strong reactions to his ministrations upon their first meeting were overjoy at being instantly accepted and sought after. There's only so much emotional buckshot I can spare for the scales of these few scenes, given the at-best puerile hand-wringing vis-a-vis a single almost hand-holding. Also, miss me with a woman character acting catty about another woman expressing interest in her man. That's like baby-tier writing. And we even already did that last chapter. 
Honestly, the only part of this that keeps me going is you getting dunked on and everyone chipping in to do it. Before you can drown from all the dunking, the crew attempts to procure cakes from the patissier. Meet Angelo Oscar Vincenzo Olivier Panettoni, patissier non pareil. He's the festival's mystery sponsor and a plant from the Glans Empire, and I don't at all mind telling you he's an asterisk scolder right now, because as a class of person, they stick out like stand users, and anyway, the end of the previous chapter already had him taunt the camera from the bad guy's side. He's supposedly here to wage chemical warfare on the town and the player characters, but his cakes are too delicious and he runs out before he can deliver a lethal dose to the party. The next morning, Hart's Child appears empty, which is some kind of big mystery to the party, but, you know, I figured everybody was hungover from nighttime revelry and all that. This is even supported by the text, so to speak, because if you play with the dog until nighttime, everyone comes back. Okay, no big deal there. Eventually done with partying, the, uh, party meets Don Zabaro, Yoko's brother who offers his blade as a means of keeping Amy busy whilst they sneak up on her through the underbridge. I like the layout and general aesthetics and theming of this dungeon. It's neat. There's also an unnecessary bit of retroactively fix it in the flavor text sequelitis that shares a common strain with modern Disney live action adaptations, where the party comes across some leftover supplies from the Black Blade's attack on Heart's Child from the previous game. See, this serves to, fire quotes, explain how Kikyo was able to get into Heart's Child when the roots were cut off. Never mind that, when that event took place, the roots were not cut off, and even if they were, the explanation of she's literally a ninja would suffice for most audiences, I think. And also, they never even bother explaining why asterisk holders show up where and when they do. Alternus Dim jumps aboard an airship from nowhere multiple times. Nobody cares. Down with explainer-style game analysis. If this was actually supposed to spackle any plot holes from Bravely Default, I fear the effort was wasted. If instead it's just a cute reminder of some of those events, well, okay, neat. At least it's brief. As is this goddamn excellent dungeon, I just can't say enough good things about the Underbridge. It's twisty enough to remain interesting and plays with routing across screen transitions in fun ways, while also expressing a consistent look and feeling like a real place that serves a real purpose. There's no levers in remote locations that operate doors on the other end of the floor, no hovering interactable crystals or secret walls that are nakedly placed for the player to interact with in sequence, no puzzles inserted to spice out the dungeon. Every single dungeon should be like this. Gary Gygax spent nearly 10 pages of the canting crew describing a single bridge, and I'm starting to understand why. Now that we've closed the distance to Amy, the party faces her head-on just after Yoko gets shot trying to protect her brother. Upon her demise, that is, Amy's demise, Yoko is fine, Amy shoots one final shot off up into the sky. Then, like in any given anime, the team relaxes in the hot springs of Yunohana for the purpose of restoring Yoko to health. I told you we would get some steam. From this point forward, the player has access to the hot springs as effectively a free inn, which is nice. Bravely games are hardly at all about resource management, so having something like this is the game being honest with itself, mechanically speaking. There is something else about this I'd like to address, and that is... gaze. I may not have a film studies degree, but I have been watching YouTube for a few years, and. What we have here is perhaps the most direct example I can give you for what the male gaze means to a video game. See, hot springses are gender segregated as a rule, leading to literally every act of hijinks in the accompanying episode that every anime has, where the guys try to sneak a peek at the girls. If you, the player, try to walk into the springs when Idia or Magnolia are in the top party position, they will refuse to enter. That's the boys' side, you see. The girl's side is inaccessible to the player. The game directly tells you it presumes your perspective is a male one and presents options accordingly. This is by no means the only instance of such a thing the game shows us, but it is the most raw, and to be honest, it's pretty disappointing for a game to directly limit its own audience. After a nice hot bath, Yoko pesters you about the Sword of the Brave, 
a legendary weapon that Don Zaburo must possess if he is to inherit the throne. Yu hems and haws about its whereabouts, and Yogo runs off to retrieve it herself. The party follows her to the next dungeon, which is themed around various kinds of steam, granting in-battle bonuses to all combatants. There are a few fixed encounters along the critical path of each room, which means even if you had been avoiding battle up to this point, you cannot avoid doing a battle in each of the rooms and thereby experiencing each of the special steam conditions. It's a heavy-handed way to do it, but that's fine. What's less fine is how the party has completely lost sight of their objectives at this point. I mean, maybe I'm the heartless one for suggesting this, but in my experience when a princess dashes off into danger of her own accord, unless you are her sworn retainer, you should just let her go and do whatever. She just caught one of Amy's bullets and all it took was a bath to get her all better? Yoko will be fine, guys. But. I guess she's our friend now, and it would be somewhat inconsistent of our main cast to leave her to fend for herself, so chase her they do. Once they catch up to her, a scene plays out in which Yoko attains the Sword of the Brave, which is a talking sword that extracts from her a Faustian covenant. She willingly offers up any price, which the sword takes in the form of cutting off Don Zabaro's arm, a sort of wombo combo curse where you can only have the sword if you can't use it. This part works way better in Sekiro. Overwhelmed at seeing this play out again, Yu describes his own experiences as a child where he did the same thing for his own brother, down to the last detail. Pencil sketches accompany this, hinting that Yu is reading from his own illustrated diary. When the party asks what he's screaming about, there is a quick fade to black where he catches them up to speed on the diary scene. Now, if that all feels too convenient, to be coincidence, the game quickly agrees with you and reveals that Yoko is actually a demon, and the sword and Don Zavaro were her illusions. She had been looking into our party's hearts and pulling on the loose threads. In Yu's case, this is conceivably traumatic, having to relive his whole deal that he has always definitely had and we totally didn't just make up. For the others, with Tiz and Magnolia, Yoko just reminds them that they have lost family. With Idia, she runs out of ideas and just says, You are the most interesting of all, proving that Idia has no time for regrets. Before that gets stale, Dark Knight Alternus Dim shows up and fends off Yoko. She counters, injuring him, then reverts to her human-ish form and tells the party that this has all been amusing and that if they want to continue with their quest, they should check out the Fire Crystal. Idia bandages Alternus' arm, and he vows to give chase to the demon. Upon approaching the fire crystal, Tiz says that it has been activated. Uh, the kind that you do if you want to summon the holy pillar, which was the whole thing from the last game. We know at this point that's bad, and the party asks Anyas about it, but she says she didn't do it. Our adventuring crew keeps relying on Anyas for information about where to go next, and her responses have been growing flaky, shall we say. I would think that characterizing the former Vestal of Wind as an airhead, while the irony isn't lost on me, is a bit of messaging at cross-purposes to her having become the world's most important person. Having her be no good with directions is one of those softball character flaws that are barely one step above having your character talk with a verbal tick or being clumsy, which is to say, acceptable as a baseline. The crew laugh this flakiness off by saying, that's our Agnes, without bothering to think about it any further. She's really taking well to the whole being kidnapped thing. With one crystal left to go, they make for Florum, but have no means to get there. The party returns to Yunohana to ask Kusatsu Arima, Lord of the Baths, if he can help, but his boat is just as bad as what they have already, and the only other option is an intractable clog. He then distracts the party with cake, and how the scene and coming battle play out depends on whom you select to get first dibs. Whoever takes the cake slowly fades from sight until they vanish, and in the panic, Angelo shows up to reveal that, yes, he was behind it, and his cakes are actually evil. In the fight itself, whoever vanished is now in ghost state, which is one hell of a deep cut of a tutorial. Here we are 20 or more hours in, and they just throw this new game mechanic in there. 
which is itself an excellent connection of Ludo narrative because it puts you, the player, more directly in the mindset of you, the protagonist, fumbling to deal with this novel danger. What an excellent thing. The party also bicker with Angelo during the fight about how he treated Amy, and the whole is he really out for revenge thing seems to remain an open question. After the party gives Angelo the chop, he threatens to ghost himself with his own cake, when a bullet from the sky knocks it out of his hands. Remember toward the beginning of the chapter, when Amy got off that last shot? I sure didn't when I played through this the first time. Anyway, this is where it lands. It turns out to be a ring, and not a bullet, and has a love letter tied to it, in which Amy expresses her regrets about being dead, and how awesome Angelo's pancakes are. This brings Angelo around to the idea of not being evil, and he walks away. Amy and Angelo are an archetype of the kind of dysfunctional relationship that only straight people ever seem to have. Now, they're both colorful weirdos who love killing, so maybe a loving relationship was never in the cards, but sheesh. With all that washed away, the party is left no better off than before, still lacking a vessel. Yu goes to soak and think it over for a bit. That is, after the scene where the whole party goes for a bath and then leaves to eat a big dinner, and then you and Magnolia go back to the baths. Magnolia is just over the fence, and they get to have a much-needed heart-to-heart in which Magnolia behaves like a somewhat reasonable person taking over an unreasonable character. Sadly, this is less a, hey, I realize now that I was poorly written before, but we can be friends now, and more... I'm going to sublimate my unearned possessiveness into coquettish flirting. The conversation then turns to their quest, which is the thing that they should have been doing this whole time. You know, the skyhold? And also, wait, what do you mean the people of Heart's Child are in a ghost state? I told you, they're hungover. You even see them again at night, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, whatever. The man with the purple pen harps at them from the roof, and explains that he's tracked the clog that was preventing the hot springs from being a boat. I forgot to explain this earlier. The party took to calling him that after they all picked different colors of pen to make notes in Yu's journal. Their mystery man chose the color purple. The party returns to Hart's child in the boat to resolve a plot thread that wasn't loose in the first place, and Sergeant Sapp and Private Piddler show up with this shitty robot to get in the way. So, somewhere around here, I think, is where the plot frayed so completely that on my first playthrough, I no longer understood where we had been or where we were going. Having replayed and rewatched and poured over it enough, I think I understand where this all came from. And my guess is that a lot of disconnected bits got designed independent of one another, and then a woebegone scenario writer had to struggle to fit it all together. The whole return to Heart's Child serves to explain a scene from earlier that did not need explaining, and comes at the cost of both the continuity and the theming of the chapter. What could have been a cross-section of personal relationships and how larger-than-life conflict affects them is instead a mishmash of chasing after a fox girl, meeting a demon in a cave, taking a lot of baths, and dismantling a comedically awful machine. Which, put that way as a dark mirror of my personal life back in the noughties. But I mean it. I think that the narrative through line of the game was one of the last things developed, and I think that among the first were the boss encounters. And the fight against Super Not Bale is a pinch point that is evidence of my guess. We had to invent a short narrative hook that unexplains a previous scene in order to get the party right here, fighting this robot on this battlefield. With the straight man buffoon comedy duo put paid to, the party pumps hot spring water through the town well, and Hart's child is saved. Magnolia vacillates over the Goodman's marriage, considering the crushing weight of duty. Finally free to pursue the skyhold, a laser beam from nowhere blasts it out of the sky. The narrator once again sends us off. In case all the other directions we went in up to this point weren't enough, there were three side quests as well. Wherever I couldn't figure out how to naturally work these into my discussion of the chapter, usually because they have nothing to do with what's going on and serve more as interruption than natural extension of the story, I'll collect them here at the end. First up, we've got Eratus Profiteur, the Merchant of Death, and Holly White, 
the white mage. Profiteur wants to buy the seaside shack from some old grandpa and his granddaughter so he can demolish and develop the property into a port town. Holly wants not that. Profiteur's reasons for being there are pretty clear, while Holly's are so inexplicable that this is how she gets introduced to the scene. Yep, just not there in one fade to black and then standing there in the next chorus line. In the scene after that, the old man who owns the shack explains the previous scene to Idia, which gives us the first hint that Idia's role in these scenarios is to rein in her dad's minions. That never develops into a full plot or even theme, though, so we need another whole subquest way later that makes it explicit. If you have no context for Profiteur's character from the first game, this whole sequence seems baffling. He's conducting market research, asking locals their opinions about landmarks, learning what the country has and what it needs, all to found a port town. And given the existence of both Yunohana and Gothaladio, which did not exist in the first game, I'd say there's reason to believe such a port could be useful or even necessary. This is like the good capitalism that only exists in fake stories. Granted, the same good outcomes could be crafted under different frameworks, but that's not the fake story we have, necessarily, and the macroeconomic structures of Lux and Dark are left intentionally vague enough for us to write in whatever and have it not necessarily contradict anything, which is a formative style of the game across the board, really. Repurposing Aratus Profiteur into Scrooge McDuck is an abstract idea for the character that could have worked. Here he's just doing ordinary stuff and barking back at Idia and Holly for pestering him, which they basically are. Just after explaining that the nation is suffering from a labor shortage, the old man from the shack shows up and says his granddaughter went in search of a job and got the only one available, which was at the mithril mine. This is a callback slash cleanup of the whole Canary Boy thing from Bravely Default, which, again, I am fine with not having things like child slavery in your fantasy game for children, but the sequence of events itself makes no sense as a story. The quest to decide if the old man and little girl should sell their home becomes the story of rescuing a little girl, not because it logically proceeds from one thing to the next, but because there is no tension in the first thing, so we need the second thing to pick up the pace a bit. On the way, Holly explains that she cares so much about this because she had a similar experience growing up. She interrupts herself to get back to the hunt for the girl. Most of the scenes in the mine are like this. Any time a character would have to explain their position in a way that can't make sense, given the setup, they say, Oops, look, there's no time for that, we gotta save the girl. Once she is saved, though, it's time to make a moral choice about eminent domain without any of the baggage that comes with it in real life. The choice makes no difference that we get to see. The only thing that even comes up later is that if you fight Holly, Profiteer gets a letter that sets up a little crumb for a later side quest, which I think is accidental because if you fight Profiteer, Holly also gets a letter from her boyfriend, so who knows. The game is uninterested in actually attempting to untangle eminent domain or even basically examine what it means to choose individual rights in favor of positive group outcomes, so my inserting anything of the sort would be wholly unnecessary, which is why I shall. Hey, unnamed old man, your shack sucks. You should move somewhere where your granddaughter doesn't have to worry about Legionnaire's disease during all her preteen and teenage years. There is a subtext of the chapter that is the sentiment of old men versus the survival of the young, and, uh, look, I get it. I'm an old man now, and seeing the natural beauty of a place despoiled for the base interests of what amounts to an inhuman quasi-intelligence that it is agnostic of human outcomes is something that would irritate my bones. But, uh, that's not quite the framing here. We're talking about a port town. I'm surprised you didn't perk up when a different random old dude called Port Towns grimy, given that he hails from one. I would gladly throw away a whole bunch of shit I'm sentimental for if it meant a lot of other people got to thrive. Fuck austerity and fuck the sentiments of old men. 
The outcome I want from this scenario is for Idia to go above Profiteur, bring the port town idea to the actual city government, and have them do it and pay him nothing. They can house two people for crying out loud. Next, there's Artemia Venus, the ranger, and Ominous Crow, the black mage. They're on an expedition into some ruins to discover the secret of Femto Flare, a powerful magic technique that Ominous's companion, Bahamut, could possibly learn with his help. Idia and crew go to deliver some supplies to them when a cave-in traps them in the ruins. Across a number of days, Ominous and Artemia argue about how to divide their limited supplies, which are only as limited as they are because Tiz recommends they hide most of what they brought to enforce the scarcity that the expedition is currently fighting over. This... I'm starting to think there's a running theme to these side stories that on the surface contain no bad guys. I think we might be the bad guys. Idia decides to either give a majority of the food to Bahamut, or to divide it equally among everyone after suffering with them for several days, while starvation progressively wears on their nerves. If Bahamut gets most of the food, he masters Femto Flare and blasts an opening. Otherwise, everyone just sort of makes it out okay. The resolution is told rather than shown, making the supposed tension of the situation laughable. Also, the fact by this point you almost certainly have a number of teleport stones. Hey, uh, how about we just share a couple of those around? We'll get untrapped right away. It won't even take a minute. Ah well. No matter what. Everyone makes it out alive and hungry. The next side quest opens with everyone having a big meal, which is a connection only possible through the magic of video editing. Idia and Magnolia keep stealing used dumplings when he isn't looking, which prompts a nearby doofus to pipe up about a case. Argent Heinkel the Knight appears and tells him the interview is cancelled because of a murder, as does Konoe Kikyo the Ninja whom the game calls Kunoichi, the video game word for girl ninja that it just presumes you know. They're investigating a murder, Heinkel as the official police presence and Kikyo as a private investigator. Idiot joins the doofus and his sycophant, who are Sholmes and Whitson, a crime-solving duo that is wholly original and not at all based on any prior fictional work well-known or otherwise. Sholmes gets in the way, leaps to conclusions, and helps not at all while the body count rises. See, the last time around, Kikyo was part of a locked room murder mystery, as the assassin, and I guess we need to do that again, but this time the asterisk wielders from Bravely Default can't be the bad guys? So here we are. Sholmes stops being a moron for one minute and puts together that his partner Whitson actually did all the murders and was in cahoots with the widow the whole time. The actual decision in the matter is telling Sholmes to either become a cop or a freelance cop, and I'm not kidding. Also, the uh, fight that you do poofs into Whitson, but you still get the asterisk? My guess is that at some point in the design of this quest, the player would have to gather all the clues and actually solve the murder, and a wrong answer would actually be bad. But with the final design of all these side quests, there can't be a wrong answer, and the fight at the end must be one of two asterisk wielders. So now we have a whole extended cast of named NPCs we need to somehow rapidly learn and care about who would have been unnecessary before. The other evidence I offer for these side quests being either an afterthought or getting hasty rewrites is that most of these scenarios have NPCs with Ace Attorney style names. Sholmes and Whitson join Land Lessor and Madame Golddigga. The three acolytes in the ominous Artemia scenario are named Jambalai, Risotto, and Paella. Oddly, the old gaffer and granddaughter do not get named at any point. They mostly speak in wide-angle scenes rather than chorus lines, where the speaker's name would be at the top left corner just over that impossibly ugly baseline splotch. Ugh. Seriously, I hate this thing, and it's always there, tormenting me. The chapter opens with two phone calls about the laser in which our contacts are rather useless for providing any information. The only tidbit is that the laser was SP-powered, 
which is the juice that you store in the hourglass that allows you to take extra turns into stopped time, a holdover mechanic from the first game that was always called Bravely Second. The team goes to Florum to investigate and relates their tale to the Matriarch. To safeguard the Water Crystal, the Matriarch sends Sylvie the Vestaling along with them to the Water Temple to put a shield around it, and that works? I rather expected something would get in the way here, but whatever. Now confident that the crystal is safe, the party takes another break to watch the Sacred Flower Festival, which is a beauty contest. Glan's Empire soldiers raid the town, demanding answers about who is behind the attack on their floating treehouse. Idia runs on stage to grab the mic and tell everyone that they're under attack. Geist, the bloody, shows up and mercs two of the dudes on stage, then uses the undo ability to bring them back, promising to repeatedly murder people unless they give up the goods. This works as well as torture does in real life, which is it terrorizes people and provides no informational value. Geist talks like an American trying to sound like Antonio Banderas, and my guess for why is that he is helming an inquisition and People sort of know what the Spanish Inquisition was, because of Monty Python, probably, and then the directors hear what the dude sounded like, and they were all, sure, let's go with that. <laughs> you are a liar, and a poor one at that. After Geist confronts Idia and claims no one is coming to rescue her, Alternus joins the fray to rescue her. Geist is impressed enough to retreat, and the Master of Ceremonies crowns Idia and Alternus the winners of the Sacred Flower Festival. Magnolia congratulates them in French, and the man in the crowd hears her, and comes up to ask her how she came to learn French. The man is Lotus, an engineer of the Sagita, a tribe descended from moon folk who possessed the remains of a battleship, including a functional superweapon. Lotus invites them to see it, and Alternus promises to stay behind and help Florum. Certainly enough in real life, Things do happen at the same time as other things, so coincidences are bound to come up. The entire plotline hinging on Lotus being in the crowd while Magnolia says some French words close enough to the microphone to be audible, and Lotus also being curious enough about it to approach her directly is pretty down out there. This comes along with excuses for alternates to show up and also quickly leave. There's a word for this. Ah tip of my tongue. Ah well, I'll remember it sooner or later and put it on the screen. Let's move on to the village. The village of Sajita is built around the cannon and floats high above the forest. It looks pretty dang cool. The village elder tells the party that he will take the shot as soon as he has it, and even Agnes gives the go-ahead to blow the place up with her in it. Now, under a strict time limit to go get Agnes out of there already, the team asks Lotus if he has any technology that might help them get to the Skyhold. He takes them to Old Sajita, the next dungeon, which is filled with invisible floors, illusory walls, and glowing glyphs. Large plinths on each floor that are a cross between Sele stones and Star Trek pads describe the life and times of a fellow named Altair, a monolithic renaissance man who invented all technology and created the compass of space and time. We also get to read his obituary. Boy oh boy, maybe should have invented the colonoscopy first. Look at this nerd, dying on the seventh minute of the seventh hour of the seventh day of the seventh month. Okay, okay, maybe I shouldn't get ahead of myself vis-a-vis -vis pissing on old Owl Tire's grave. Why do they keep saying Owl Tire anyway? Owl Tire. Owl Tire. Owl tire. Am I losing my mind? The word is Altair, named for a star. It's a real word. You can just say the real word. There's another little mistake that comes up here that I'd like to call attention to. It happens in some of the side scenarios also, but here we are on the main line, so no matter how much content you skip, it occurs in the game. See, the auto advance feature is timed to the voice lines, meaning the timing will change depending on what language you have enabled. Neat. But also, for on-screen text that is not voiced, the auto-advance will make it go away as soon as it is loaded. It's jarring to observe. Less so here than in the Black Mage Ranger scenario, where there is a text update on screen for each passing day. Back to the cave. 
Although the party learns a lot about Altair, they find nothing useful and you complains about it. Idiot tells him, nobody likes a whiner, which is just delightful. They return to Sajita and ask Lotus if he has a plane. He tells them that the city is built on the remains of a battleship, but that still doesn't help. Hey, uh, President of the Moon, Appleberry, the old Space Force is looking a little idle. Could we borrow one of those from the bottom screen? No? Okay, I had to ask. Frustrated, Yu explores the depths of the ship slash city to see if they, I don't know, left a flying machine in mothballs and forgot about it. He finally starts smashing a loose panel on the outside with his fists, and it does pop off, although he also tumbles to his death in the attempt. Magnolia dives after him, and they land on a floating rock. They, uh, make it back okay, now with the knowledge that some of the rocks float. Altair finally shows his face, revealing that he's been inhabiting Tiz's body the whole time. He starts to tell them the Kaiser's true objective, but they get interrupted. Geist shows up to hassle everybody. He's functionally immortal, and it kicks you out of the fight after a few rounds. Altair then uses the SP in the nearby tank to, uh, do something that diminishes Geist's regeneration, and you get the real version of the fight. Geist tries to take the cannon down with him. Lotus jumps in the way. His son Procyon jumps in the way. Uh, finally, Idia jumps in the way, and Geist attempts to repent for the sake of his tragic backstory before dying in front of us. Now that that's out of the way, we can get back to talking about the Kaiser. Altair tells us that the Kaiser plans to go back in time and change history, which... Okay, cool, we were planning on stopping his plans, no matter what they were anyhow. Also, why act so cagey about your theory or whatever? You know how I figured his plan was to use the compass of space and time? He, uh, and I know this is out there, he took it. So I figured he was going to use it for the one thing it does. But hey, nice to understand the stakes finally. Glad we're getting that here in Chapter 3. This dude is absolutely the tuxedo mask of the game. Anya skypes in to tell them that the Skyhold is on the way to the Temple of Water, and by the time we catch up, she's there awakening the crystal, and we're too late. The mystery of why Anya is seemingly working with the Kaiser is left unvoiced and unexplained for the moment. Anna the fairy taunts the party and unleashes Vukub Kakish on them, the last of the wacky machines with Sap and Piddler. Nikolai also shows up to get in the way. He goes on about the force of will and recites his tragic backstory while the noise of the crystal shining behind him drowns him out. My sins. You heard from Jan, did you not? Of the evil rotting the crystal guard from within? Shame about your little prepared speech there. Anyway, you and crew beat him up. The Kaiser half-heartedly laments the loss of his underlings and Jan shows up again. He's, uh... He's alive still, somehow. Back to the party, Lotus and Sakura fly in on the Rub-A-Dub, which Yu had asked Lotus to make airborne. They make for the Holy Pillar, and the narrator closes us out with a seemingly nonsensical lamentation of love and longing. Now that men are allowed to live in Florum, the headmistress, Ursula Yu Duit, is trying to decide whether the new school should be integrated or segregated by sex. Two of the teachers are of different minds about it. Barris Lair the Monk argues for sweaty tracksuit that they should be schooled together, and Einheria Venus the Valkyrie argues on behalf of Ms. Rhea Veeling that boys and girls should be schooled separately. Although both Barris and Einheria seem to be checked out of what is actually happening, which, I mean, mood. Very little happens beyond the characters making the worst possible arguments for their side. No, really, the, the whole thing is you do it foisting the work off to Idia, one conversation with each of Sweaty and Rhea, then the choice and fight. To pad this out, we get a little extra text about either Barris or Einheria, each of them thinking about moving on from the constant fighting thing and settling down. Einheria's send-off comes with a lengthy Hey, No homo! Which, yep, sucks. 
Now, I like the idea of a story centering on a Valkyrie settling down from a life of combat and getting married, maybe ambiguously due to a powerful sleeping spell slash curse, and coming to terms with the shifting priorities of her own heart even as the circumstances of her life also feel out of her control, only to take control of both her own heart and life by force of arms. Look, Odin's Sphere is really good. I really like Odin's Sphere. I'll stop pulling from it. Raka Peller grandson of famed bard Archipeller, uncovered a lost song by the Old Master. Performer Praline Alamode wants to adapt the song and lyrics in her own style, and pirate Hayridden Barbarossa wants the song preserved in its original form and the rights of the estate invoked to prevent adaptation, a kind of Pirate's Code meets egregious copyright law arc, without anything as cool or interesting as that label implies. Idia picks one and fights the other, like always. Grand Ship is experiencing hyperinflation due to taxes to fund their social safety net. Time Mage Eloquentis Camer tries to convince the ruling council to dismantle the social safety net and abolish taxes, and Dark Knight Alternus Dim opposes this, concerned with the well-being of the many orphans who are wards of the state. Why either of these two have a stake in a nation to which they don't belong, well, Khmer gets a motivation if you choose to side with Alternus, where he nakedly wants to establish austerity so he can helm the state himself. Also, he isn't a citizen and was posing as a member of the ruling class illegally in the first place, which, you know. If you go with Khmer, his reforms actually work and the economy becomes good enough that individual charity is sufficient to keep the kids alive and fed, and someone comes along to give them jobs, isn't that sweet? Why the fuck are these games so thirsty for child labor? Holy shit. This whole scenario is fucked, by the way. Taxation does not lead to inflation. I just... There is a particular attitude that Bravely Second takes toward its own storytelling and setting sensibilities, which I'll call tongue-in-cheek presentism. The setting is one of low technology supplemented with magic, maybe a pre-industrial or early industrial one. Now, since we don't want our whole story to be about that, generally we skimp on the particulars, hand wave numbers here and there, and focus mainly on the microcosm of a handful of actors. And that's fine. Where the tongue-in-cheek presentism comes into play is when anything anachronistic comes up. The existence of widespread murder mystery literature, consumer culture about music production and distribution, idol culture, vague references to modern business and labor practices, schools and universities, and so on. It's top to bottom, what if we took this thing from the present day and put a magipunk coat of paint on it? This attitude can survive for as long as it doesn't interfere with the tone of a work and how lighthearted or dark and edgy it is. The more serious I'm supposed to take your story, the more explanations all the out-of-time references are going to need. With more lighthearted fare, I can ignore the anachronisms as charming, but as soon as the very underpinning of a scenario relies on a misplaced modern-day cultural concept, the story is inside out. You've taken what was supposed to be a tidbit of set dressing and turned it into the structure. And that could stand, but here it breaks. With nothing else in our way, the squad makes for Agnes's prison. What they find is Revenant, son of Geist, a spooky ghost child who inhabits a suit of armor and can possess people. In a tremendous fit of restraint, the game does not serve this up as the explanation for Agnes being flaky and awakening the crystals. We're instead left to draw our own conclusions based on how Revenant's gimmick works in battle, and that is truly dope. This is spoiled somewhat by Rev whining like the child he is and going, on and on about his tragic backstory. Nonetheless, Agnes isn't there, so the squad continues to the throne room. Before we get there, I'm going to talk about X-Men. 
There's a reason I defend the video game as an art form to folks who think it is too much kiddish kitsch. What I call the sublime moment. The point where the game forces you to approach a situation in a way you had never thought of as being part of playing a video game. Where figuring out just what to do next results in a most satisfactory and unexpected answer. For example, in X-Men for the Sega Genesis, Stage 5 is called Mojo's Future Crunch. As the ultimate form of entertainment, Mojo, the alien showrunner, teleports warriors from across time and space to compete in blood sport at the end of the universe, to see who will emerge victorious before the big crunch happens and the universe ends. After defeating Mojo in this stage, a television shows Professor X in the background, mouthing something at you. The jaws keep closing in even after all enemies are gone, and you lose if the jaws meet. To win, you have to do a soft reset of the system by pressing the reset button on your console. This exploits a feature of the console itself, where certain values are held in memory through a soft reset, and the game designers decided to make use of it here. That is the sublime moment. The game, by design, guides you to making a decision or a realization that would have been unthinkable at the start. This particular moment even draws a diegetic link between the game console and Professor X's danger room. It absolutely works. It is the thing I like the best. Plenty of games try to do this and fail at it. The whole Psycho Mantis thing is one such moment that probably springs to mind, and okay, I could see that landing also, but it's just so overwrought and tacky, surrounded by a whole mess of jank dialogue and theme soup. Which reminds me, Bravely Second is mostly also a mess. With as many main plot threads and warring themes, it's hard to imagine it could pull such a moment. But it does. After nearly catching up to the Kaiser, his fairy minion buys him the crucial seconds he needs to escape, and the party loses. Anna obliterates the moon, destroying Magnolia's home and killing everyone she knows. Color fades from the world. The water stills. The soundtrack fades out. Even the wind is gone. And that yarn about the moon being first line of defense against space monsters? That wasn't just a cute bit of fluff. At the end of chapter 4, all this happens, and now every random encounter on the world map is replaced with this. The balls are reused from Bravely Default, where they were bonus bosses that would appear in Narende from the Nemesis system. That same mechanic was part of the moon in Bravely Second, too, with even more options for how you chose to engage. But here, in this moment, all that is out of your hands. The party has lost, and Lux and Dark suffers in a way you get to experience directly. The only way out is to use New Game Plus and activate Bravely Second when the Kaiser attacks at the beginning of the game. This starts a new loop where the Kaiser rapidly changes up his plans because the party now has perfect knowledge of what those plans were. The whole sequence is a masterpiece. It is ludo-narrative harmony I rarely see in any game. If only more of the game were this or in service of this, it would have been one of the greatest games of all time. A part of me is still there, in that cursed land, still stunned that the game lets me experience it. The first time I played through Bravely Second, the time with the dog piss anecdote, I got so muddled and beaten down by the scattershot plot that I just stopped. I still have that save file. It's at the part right before the fight with Anna. Right before the Kaiser gets away and the moon blows up. I stopped just before the good part. This is what it costs you when your plot is too all over the place. I am glad I took a second shot at this game, whether I did so bravely or otherwise. And I sorely wish that the game had maintained this quality level, or at least this momentum. The world is a wasteland now, and you can have as much of that as you want. They managed to make it personal. 
So let's take it back to the beginning. Okay, I did get a little ahead of myself. As Chapter 5 begins, when you activate Bravely Second in the initial battle with the Kaiser from New Game Plus. After you beat him up, the mask slips, and Kaiser Oblivion is Yu's secret older brother, Denny, who got heavily telegraphed back in Chapter 2. Anyway, they arrest him. We get Anya's back, and everybody hugs it out. She gives a speech as part of a ceremony to formally end the Eternian Orthodoxy conflict, and no matter how many failed loops you go through, even zero, she claims that her time-traveling ordeal happened over and over and over again, which is cute to imagine. Thinking back to the beginning, there's the Kaiser coming at us, and he's got all his levels and such from just going through all this a bunch of times. This claim of Agnes's does raise a pair of questions we'll be examining a bit later, but whatever. We get our accolades, and all the world leaders are on our side now. Jan and Nikolai bust the Kaiser out of jail, so it's off to the chase. About time we had some momentum. Too bad they get a little, uh, wordy about it to keep that momentum going. Bella and Ku slide in to give them an escape path, and we have a battle where we hear their tragic backstory. This whole chapter is going to be like this, by the way. All the asterisk wielders we buried in the first loop attack again tell us about how sad they are and how it led them to be bad, and then when you spares them when they demand death, he just sort of says, dang, that's all sad, but I can't change it. I'm going to not kill you because that would just be further tragedy. And then they're just like, oh geez, I hadn't thought this through. Also, the Great Plague is going to come up a few times, so let's have all that out. See, the supposed inciting incident for the Eternian Revolt to overthrow the Orthodoxy was their botched handling of the plague. That all went down before the events of the first game. I want to get it all in one place, because accounts of the plague in this chapter alone morph to fit whichever specific asterisk holder would feel most bad about their hand in it, often to self-contradictory ends. Thirty years before the events of Bravely Default, Brave was a priest of the Orthodoxy. Then, after ten years, the Great Plague hit, he renounced crystallism, gathered an army, and after another five years, led a coup. The timeline gets a bit funky, because between the Japanese release and the other releases of the game, Idia and the others get aged up, and the localizer's hands were tied. Nevertheless, details are scant. There was a plague, Brave took over Eternia and started using the Earth Crystal to enact universal healthcare, and that basically worked. Now in Bravely Second, we hear about the plague from Geist and Norzin in a few different places. Geist takes responsibility for the plague, claiming in the most roundabout terms that he was called off to a boat to perform an exorcism and discovered instead Patient Zero, and allowed the various unnamed persons in power involved on the boat to let her and the rest of them go somewhere. And then the plague happened. Sure. So, after one year, the first wave was over, basically running out of hosts, which is, a uh, a hard story to hear in 2020. Norzen, Geist presumably, and Minette's mom worked for four years to develop a vaccine to prevent the second pandemic, and Minette's mom used cat DNA, experimenting on Minette and herself to do it, which cost her her life. So, Geist is both responsible for the plague and for the cure, except that's actually Minette's mom, except really it's Brave capturing and using the Earth Crystal and trying to make this make sense was a mistake. It's a world-building beat hit again and again for pathos to add the illusion of depth to all the bad guy characters, and how well that works is up to just how bad you're willing to feel about the 90,000 hit points worth of boss you just had to beat up. It's tonal whiplash to go from the high momentum struggle of combat to this, and this chapter does it five times. So, if it sounds like I'm being a little hard on tragic backstories, this is why. I've just... I've eaten enough of them. Chapter 4 was theoretically unlimited in length, 
because you can do any number of wrong loops, but chapter 5 feels longer than that because of all the goddamn chatting. But okay, okay. Back to summarizing with me. The party rushes to grab the compass, and they get to it first. Idia suddenly hands it over to Geist, being momentarily possessed. Geist and Revenant run away with it, and we give chase, but Brave stops them in their tracks, and it's fight time again. After a sound drubbing, Geist and Brave bond over being dads, which makes Idia feel kind of bad, so she tries to give Rev some advice. But he's like eight or some shit, so I'm pretty sure all of this is going over his head. Now with the compass, the team heads off to the cat clouder to plant disinformation with the cats about what our next steps are going to be. Amy and Angelo are in the way, though, and they remember getting a beat down, so they're hungry for more. There's practically no justification for them fighting the party at this point, and the game puts a lampshade on that. But I'm willing to give the game a pass on this one, because it is literally any boss fight in this chapter where no one has to drone on about some bad things that happened to them 15 years ago. After dispersing the pancake line, we get to the cat colony and plant some disinformation. Like a complete buffoon, the Kaiser falls for it and gets the Skyhold blasted yet again for his efforts. The party lands on the Skyhold, but the Kaiser isn't there, Instead, Jan and Nikolai get in the way. The party gives them a black eye, and Yu promises to reform the Crystal Guard and simultaneously disperse the power of the High Houses and also give Jan and Nikolai jobs. A lot more generous than the jail time some of the other Asterisk Colders are getting, huh? Guess those reforms don't include nepotism as a form of corruption. This is seconds after saying we're going to disband the High Houses. <laughs> cool. Nevertheless... Satisfied with these token reforms, Jan and Nikolai give up the goods about Denny's whereabouts. He's gone to the mausoleum beneath Gothladio. I guess he went there to brood or something? Anyway, he knew we would catch up with him, so Denny decided to come here so he could hit us with a history lesson about how bad and wrong their granddad was. Basically, founder Jenny Olja, yes, that's his name, created the cops. And then, just like in real life, they became an instrument of violence on behalf of the state, and I am starting to understand why Denny wants to hit a big button that would wipe all that out. Nevertheless, we sort him out in combat once again, even earning his asterisk, which is a nice touch. We take him back home, Agnes frees him and shows him that we kept all his comrades alive this time, basically mollifying him into admitting that even if we can't stop the cops from ever having been formed, we can defund and abolish them today, which actually makes Agnes greater than any non-fictitious pope ever. And he pretty much comes around. But, uh, you know, if you've played a JRPG before, you know that this isn't the end. In the meantime, we get to enjoy some casual dining scenes and torment each other about how totally obsessed Magnolia and you are. Denny sublimates into the role of older brother who tries to knock some of the juvenile ideas out of Yu's head about how to behave, and it's kind of charming. Before Yu can act on that advice, the Holy Pillar appears in the background and we gotta go deal with that now. We make for the Skyhold and the Throne Room, where Anna has Florum's matriarch and Sylvie the Vestling, which is how she awakened the crystals again. Sylvie is even voiced this time. Anna summons Diamante, the greatest of the ball, who is even more buckwild looking than the others. The party fights it to a standstill. Diamante has seemingly unlimited regeneration, and since it happens in an in-battle cutscene, there's nothing we can do about it. Denny grabs the space-time compass and does some Doctor Who shit while his battle theme plays in the background, which functionally removes Diamante from existence along with Denny himself. And that's a chapter. Chapter 5 represents a pretty significant spike in difficulty. The world's smallest monsters have 8,000 hit points now, which is a seismic shift in how you can approach chain battling, which is the most efficient means of level grinding. So, if you didn't do enough of that before starting the good loop, all of your options for getting more numbers are a lot worse than they were a second ago, and you couldn't have known that until just now when the asterisk wielders get their redux fights, 
where you take them out two at a time. This is a problem in as much as it gets in the way of the story flow. It's hard to remember what was going on in a previous scene if you just spent two hours across four attempts of knocking over a pair of bosses. If between much longer battles and much longer cutscenes this chapter is somehow still paced well, then congratulations, you were a genius for doing all the right stuff. I'm a moron, and I had a tough time of it. I realize I've been pretty stingy with details about how combat do, but bear with me. We're still in story summary. Why is there a chapter 6? We just did it, right? I mean, we defeated and reformed the Kaiser. He took out Diamante. Anna's plans are well rolled up at this point. We're plumb out of conflict, y'all. You're telling me I got a whole other chapter to get through? Well, yes. See, where my opinion is that the game peaked at the end of chapter 4, the writers think the best is yet to come, and I think they're wrong. You awakens in the bed in Caldizla, harkening back to the beginning of Bravely Default and every successive loop of that game. It was something of a touch point, and this is handled with a decently light touch, so no big deal. It's even cute that Caldizla is subtitled The Land of Endings, as a mirror to its subtitle in Bravely Default, The Land of Beginnings. Turns out, activating the space-time compass had some unintended side effects to the tune of everyone suddenly remembering that Caldizla exists. Until Chapter 6, this continent doesn't appear on the world map, which is kinda neat and decently plot-hooky, so... Okay, where do you want to go from here, game? Alternus Dim shows up again, takes credit for rescuing Idia and company, and dashes off after Yoko. The party shares information, and everybody thinks it's weird that we all forgot this whole island existed. I guess it's kind of like how New Zealand gets left off of world maps nowadays. We talk to the king. He's no help. Egil shows up. Hey, remember Egil? Where did he come from? Oh, you found him in a mine, huh? This is once again the game glossing over the darker elements of the previous title. Egil was a child slave that the sword bearers used as free mining labor and an early warning system of toxic fumes they called Canary Boys. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, he's cute and he's here, and he even has a new job, which sucks from the perspective of child labor and all that, but I'm gonna headcanon this as everybody in Caldizla just sort of letting him make believe while they do all the real work so that he can gradually process what it has meant to live an entire career as a laborer before hitting puberty. And he's got a cute outfit. There's a disturbance in Lantoto Villa to the north, and rats. It's a ball. How did that get there? The team sorts out Turtle Dove and is rightfully baffled at how it could have gotten past the moon and also be more powerful than Diamante was. Appleberry doesn't know what the fuck either. Everyone is baffled. Altair chimes in and decides that Anna must be behind it, suggests we find her, and the camera pans over to Narende Crater, where Anna monologues about her dark desires. Now that she's found this crater, she can connect to the Celestial Realm directly and turn Lux and Dark into one big ball pit. I'm content to let her sit and stew for a while. Between the rapid repurposing of the plot to suit a new antagonist and a brief reminder of that chapter we had from the previous game that was about child slavery, I'm ready for a break. I'm not ready to deal with the rest of the plot of this chapter, so the side plots are going to get some screen time. Around this point, you may be curious as to why there are two missing slots in the job wheel. It would be a good place for a final this or that mission, but one that has prestige jobs attached to it, so it's only available in the concluding loop, and actually represents a choice you can neither take back nor choose both, which would serve to make the rest of those choices more practice for this one, and give a better reason for them to be fluffy and easily split. Excitement mounts, as Templar Brave Lee, Grand Marshal of the Duchy of Eternia, says this more or less directly to the player, albeit through talking to Idia, of course. One final test. One final choice. 
It's pretty obvious that the Templar job is one of these, but what could the other be? This game and this series has had some pretty huge twists before anything goes. The excitement probably fades somewhat when you follow the blue bangs like you have done for the whole game, and they lead to Brave himself in the depths of the vestment cave, and you talk to him and he just has nothing to say. See, the conditions for this quest are that you first collect Brave's sword and shield, which are in Everlast Tower and Eternia Prison. Each of these unlocks a cutscene with one of the world leaders, the sword for the Sagita Elder, and the shield for Commander Goodman. Because the items are flags for each scene, and each scene is a sort of flag for later options when talking to Brave, the map marker system that puts blue bangs for critical locations doesn't function for this. You have to use reading comprehension and a whole lot of guesswork. Oh sure, first thing on my mind was talking to the Elder of the Sajita after picking up the sword. Sure is a shame we had to haul all the way out here and couldn't use the crystal pendant phone that we all definitely have. Nevertheless, the Elder of Sajita says you gotta have a weapon to destroy your enemies, and Goodman says you gotta have a shield to protect the people. Okay. So anyway, after collecting the sword and shield, and talking to the Elder and Goodman, another scene unlocks where you talk to Alfred, who says, Sure, we have cool swords and shields, but we lock that shit away in the basement, because framing rulership around dealing with deadly external conflict will only espouse that conflict, and the goal of a ruler should be an end to that, rather than an eternity of it. Which is... You know, that does sound nice. I'm glad I have these fantasy games to escape to sometimes. With all that done, then you go see Brave in the Cave, and the scene only plays if you have Idia equipped with either the sword, the shield, both, or neither, and none of your other party members are equipped with either of them. That's where I beefed it in my playthrough. They were, you know, Good equipment, so I equipped them to the appropriate character. <laughs> Considering the game never did anything like this, either before or since, I can forgive a bit of the gear grinding noise that arises between the attitude of how literally every other side quest played out and this one. And I understand that the point of this was to make the player come to the correct conclusion without being presented with options in a list, which from that perspective is neat. But boy howdy was this poorly implemented. There's a line Idia reads for sword, and a line for shield, a line for both, and an extra line for neither. I think this is all just extra dialogue because the important part is the fight. Templar Bravely is no slouch, and stands up twice during the fight after being toppled. Finishing him off results in him formally retiring and passing the staff of leadership to Idia, since she has proven that she can rule. We'll talk more about that later. For now, we got the Templar asterisk, and it seems that there wasn't another choice available, really. I mean, sure, making a choice and sticking by it opened up the dialogue and the fight and the asterisk, but these have been about choices between asterisks. What could be missing? There's another empty slot. There's also another pretty big side quest available at this point in the game that's practically the continuation of Chapter 2. I know I've been pretty short with my descriptions of the side quests since there's a Brazilian of them and because they're all shite, but this one gets more airtime because it manages to be compelling, unique, and even worse. Since the vampire castle was a thing in Bravely Default, it needs to be a thing again here, and since we're officially out of classes from the base game, since I'm pretty sure they expect you to just make the opposite choice on a second loop, and there's a missing spot on the ring of hats and coats, what we get is a critical mass of hooks for one's curiosity. Those hooks reel you into Vampire Castle, which is the one area in the game outside of the prologue where the encounter rate slider is fixed at neutral. Yoko is here again, see, and she taunts the party saying, you play by my rules here, meaning no skipping random encounters. You can still run, use the freelancer escape skill, or throw a teleport stone, so really what she's saying is she's going to waste your goddamn time. 
The helm of Alternus Dim is on the first floor, and Idio worries something might have happened to him. At each painting on our way up, Yoko lengthily describes to us the truth about herself, the Great Plague, and founder and greed Geniolge's involvement. She constantly opens with a complaint about how long it took the party to get to the next floor, which is cheeky coming from someone who deliberately wasted our time with all the random encounters. I personally did not need then, and do not now need, yet another refresher of Luxendark's collective trauma about a plague, nor yet another rewrite about who was responsible. In a roundabout way, her story goes like this. 4.5 billion years ago, unnamed demiurges concentrated all pestilence within a little girl and personified the Origin Plague, then sealed her away in a cave. She slept, and the legacy of this act led her to becoming the hypostasis of yokai in common perception. 1,000 years ago, Foundar Geniolja uncovered her and said, Whoa dang, it sure sucks that your body has every plague. I can't do anything, but I promise one day, one of my descendants will. Then, 20 years ago, Greed Geniolja, used dad, busted Yoko out along with an embarrassment of ancient riches he had tomb raided. He sailed back home, but when others aboard rightly worried about the whole origin plague thing, said, maybe we should quarantine this girl, Greed paid off the church to perform a brief exorcism ritual rather than do anything meaningful, then he poisoned his men's rum, killing them, sank all but one of his ships, and landed home with the girl, the treasure, and the plague. This serves to retcon a little why Yoko seemed determined to torment you personally, both in Chapter 2 and in the events of his childhood described there, but at the cost of hitting that same pathos bell yet again and real hard, and also presenting supposed truth as told by our momentary antagonist who takes multiple forms and whose whole shtick before was creating illusions. This whole thing is both a waste of a villain concept and the likely outcome of writing the words Great Plague on a napkin and making that your lore bible for the scenario writers to share. On the top floor, Yoko peers into Idia's heart, exposing her deep-seated fear of loneliness, where she says she misses ring a bell, of all people. So, god damn it all, I guess I have to clear the air about that. In Bravely Default, ring a bell was one of the four main characters. He was an archetypical, fire quotes, rake, in that his every other line was thirsting for idea. She would tell him to put a sock in it, and that was more or less their whole relationship. I think party chat scenes are apocryphal, because the best bit of character building between them happens in the party chat scene from chapter 4 when Idia busts the party out of prison. Because you can break the other three out in any order, Idia gets a personal scene with each of them. In the party chat scene with Ringabell, he positively gushes, thanks and praises, and promises anything at all as recompense. Idia sighs and point blank says, I want you to go out with me. And this, unvoiced, is dripping with irony. She flat out stuffs him by superficially giving in to his constant thirsting, and he basically comes undone as a person. It's delightful. She exposes his whole thing as just an act from top to bottom, just to get it out of the way so they can move on with their quest. Also, as a person, Ringabell is actually Alternus Dim from the previous world, who suffered amnesia as a result of the trauma of the Holy Pillar. The game gets a little, uh, loose with this, shall we say, when in the climactic scene of ourselves from other worlds shipping in to fight back against a Roboros, every world has both a Ringabell and an Alternus, but whatever. That's who Ringabell is. That idea should now pine for him is ludicrous, but hey, the heart wants what the heart wants. And then, ta-da! He's here now. He's much taller for some reason. Ringabell explains that he's a plains warden now, and that means he gets to show up wherever, take credit for everything, and then vanish again like Jace Bellerin. This is the only textual reference in Bravely Second to the multiverse, and referencing it here with this character serves up the worst of all combinations of callback and innovation. Now suddenly, all those questions I had before about which numbered multiverse world this is and where are Tiz and Idia from 
are no longer frivolous. Just like having Ring a Bell and Ultranus Dim at the same time, the plot wants to have it both ways. Remember this, but don't think about it. There's a fight to do besides. Ring a Bell actually joins in the fight against Yoko the Yokai as a guest character. Remember when I said they should have done that for Yoko back in Chapter 2 when she was tagging along in human form? Yeah, it would have served as a parallel to this thematically and mechanically. But without that, I guess it's just a regular boss fight with a little help on your side. Yoko busts out some pretty intimidating moves, but with the occasional special move from Ringabell and application of good fighting, she goes down the same as the other bosses from this chapter. After the fight, Ringabell promises to be there whenever Idia is in danger, and vanishes as she cries for him to stay. This sucks a lot. See, the most fun part of their relationship from Bravely Default was how Idia occasionally roped Ringabell into putting his money where his mouth is, and also how Ringabell was dating around with other ladies while they were on their grand adventure. It served to temper the friction of their relationship from something clearly one-sided, creepy, and borderline abusive into something mostly harmless and mutual. But hey, these are cartoon characters and not real people we're talking about, so across a whole game I came to like how Ringabell and Idia cared about each other even if it was colored as Ringabell being a rascal and Idia putting up with them. It was a fine, fictional relationship, just kind of trash for the basis of a romance. Now, I've read my fair share of romances and bodice rippers by this point, and I think everyone should because a good romance will inoculate you against a bad one. All the water quotes, romance subplots slapped onto movies and video games are so pathetic and toothless compared to even the mediocre ones I've read from the genre. Which is, I mean, yes, ultimately the point of genre fiction, but because this genre is both femcoded and maligned, I feel like the common viewer is being a fed a steady diet of garbage with respect to romances outside of the romance genre, and the same does not apply with other genres exports to mainstream viewing. Taking Idia's relationship with Ringabell from the first game and spinning it into her secretly pining after him, and for him to planeswalk onto the scene whenever she's in danger only to promptly leave, is for one, a dogshit relationship on the surface, and two, undermines Idia's character as built up across two full games. Miss me with the you'll miss me when I'm gone shit. Maybe no I won't. Yoko's whole speech to her beforehand is like a who's who of no homo for the game's characters, which is a little embarrassing to put in a list like that. Like, Yoko is just reciting all the official ships the writers had penned down to get out in front of any fan pairings. But since you asked, let me tell you how to take this romance plot completely as is and actually make it good. Have Idia become Grand Marshal. She becomes all about her career, still loves fighting, but rules with discretion and wisdom. Her advisors keep asking her to take a suitor, but she shrugs off the notion because her love and lust are reserved for special occasions. She's figured out that all she needs to do to make a booty call is get into deadly danger, which suits her fine because she loves fighting and can really only put up with ring -a -bell in small doses and is otherwise kind of only low-key interested in sex and intimacy. So, if you even need conflict in such a story, you can pull one from anywhere because we're dealing with the ruler of a fantasy nation on one hand and a literal planeswalker on the other. Maybe we don't even need a monster from beyond the veil of time and space. Maybe just one or the other of them doesn't like how their relationship is going and you work from there. Not enough for you. Okay, next pitch. Idea does constantly jones for Ringabell and schemes to get him to show up and then hitch herself to him as he planeswalks away. She gathers all the information she can dig up about both the plains wardens and ancient monsters and executes the plan, unleashing some terrible evil on the multiverse. When Ringabell shows up, she hits him with the magical binding MacGuffin that she found and his enthusiasm at getting to see her again slowly fades to horror over just what she did in order for that to happen. Then, depending on how you want to play it, we get a tragedy where a deranged Idea commits endless atrocity for the sake of being together again, or a light-hearted romp where Ringabell faces increasingly preposterous dangers while Idia cackles with delight at the twin joys of sex and combat. 
still not enough. Let's not get greedy now. Okay, how about this one? Adia realizes that the relationship she wants can only happen if she and Ringabel are equals, so she abdicates the throne and sets out training to become a Plains Warden herself. However, that is supposed to happen. Maybe she consults Agnes over proper applications of crystals and ancient holy relics to do it, so we even get some good girl talk time out of it. She does join the Plains Wardens, and the rest of the story is Ringabel and Idia riding a flying motorcycle across time and space, fighting monsters, and making out in the downtime. So there, I fixed it. You're welcome. Now, just so long as neither Idia or Ringabel appear in Bravely Default 2, it will stay good forever. Let's see how long that lasts. In a June 2020 interview with Famitsu, Directors Tomoya Asano and Masashi Takahashi said of Bravely Default 2, characters from previous entries will not be in this one. So hey, maybe it really will stay good forever. But anyway, there's the last asterisk, and with it the ability to crank all the other jobs to 11. Yokai also carries with it a quest to defeat the seven deadly sins, ancient evils buried away from long ago, that also unlock the yokai's powers. They're reused bosses from Four Warriors of Light, given a glow up for their appearance on the 3DS, and the backing track for their fights is the battle theme from that game. This is how to do a nostalgia bowl. You get to reuse the best of your enemy design and make a whole bunch of optional content with minimal talking about who they are or where they came from. Just a wink at the audience, and those in the know will get it, and for everyone else, you just have seven pretty tough and unique bosses united by a theme song. So it works, no matter what. Can you tell I liked Four Warriors of Light for the Nintendo DS? Hey, did I tell you all about Four Warriors of Light yet? Yeah, it's this game I liked. Maybe you heard of it. Sometimes also called Four Heroes of Light. It had hats. Okay, no more stalling by remembering things I liked better. The party catches up with Anna at Narende Crater, and she plays the part of mean girl that manipulated Yu's older brother, like that one episode of literally every high school teen drama except for Teen Wolf, where there the mean girl justified her actions because she was a werewolf belonging to the pack of a rival alpha, and they only- Anna cops to working for Providence, a malevolent god who plans to unleash the ball menace upon the world to destroy and remake it. So we finally gotta sort her out. Her true form is closer to Fey King than Ares' half-caterpillar, half-demon vibe, which is something. After the party destroys her, she asks Providence if she did herself proud to no response. The party prays to open the way to the Celestial Realm, they all chip in, Agnes chips in over the phone, and finally a prompt appears for the player to press X. I'm sorry, push X? Wait. Did it always say push? Push? X? That sounds wrong. Hold on. Nope. It said press in the last game, and now it says push. I am not losing my mind. Anyway, thought you would get away without pressing X 255 times, player? Guess again. Ooh hee hee. That all done with, we descend into the Celestial Realm, each floor of which is styled after a specific event in the romance of Altair and Vega. These same backgrounds reflect the backgrounds of the fights with the ball from before. The ball take form around these events and spring to life from the despair that Vega continues to feel at the loss of her love, you see. It's a pretty wacky justification for anything, but you know, I genuinely did not expect going into the thing that there would be a dungeon floor that had floating roast chickens all over the place, so you know what? You did it, y'all. You subverted my expectations, and you get a gold star. The party enters a church where Vega, the floating pink soul, beefs out Altair for abandoning her, which, uh, kinda doesn't square with the part where he died of colon cancer, but whatever, whatever. Unvoiced lines don't count as real ones, I guess. Providence swoops in and expresses pleasure at human despair, intimating that Vega has been a near-infinite wellspring of this emotion fuel for forever, and we tussle. Midway through, Providence draws on Vega to heal back up, and Altair calls out to her to stop. She does, and the fight can continue uninterrupted. Providence is vanquished, Altair's soul leaves Tiz's body, 
You can tell he's the boy because he's the blue one, you see. And the two souls float off and up after Altair ends the mass by saying, go in friendship like an IRL priest would. Which is, you know, almost, uh, symbolic-ish? But whatever, he's gone. On the way out of the room, backlit blacklight clouds crush into view an upside-down pyramid with the Eye of Horus within. Again, exactly like going to church in real life. This is Providence's final form, a mishmash of Illuminati logos. The uh, attack names are also superficially themed after a common modern-day conspiracy theory dog whistle jargon, so there's that. Providence taunts the party by insisting that someone else is in control, finally staring out the fourth wall and addressing the player directly. This part struck me as pretentious because, uh, bravely second, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but pathologic you ain't. I don't care how many times you referenced a great plague. To assert dominance, the game cuts away to the title screen, and every input advances the cursor toward the delete all saves button and clicks yes. It's not as good as that sublime moment I went on about a few hours ago, but it's pretty good. Yu shatters the screen and insists that he's cool with being your puppet and together we can achieve anything and, and all that. The complete cast of asterisk wielders from this game, none of the ones from Bravely Default, mind you, give you an attaboy from their side of the screen, like the part at the end of Final Fantasy IV except aimed at the camera. It's... I don't know. It's wrapped around to being delightfully cheesy for me at this point. Go on then, blow rainbows up my ass, I can use any advantage I can get for this boss. The other cheeky thing Providence will do is activate Bravely Second, the move, and attack you while you are planning your turn, which is always a shock and just perfect, frankly, for the final boss of this game. They also had the decency to only have two segments to this fight rather than the, I can't even remember, five that a Roboros had? If there's ever a time to state your thesis directly, it's just before or during the final boss battle. The thesis here seems to be, let's fight together, you, the human child playing the video game, and me, a pre-recorded message delivered alongside a 3D model of a human child. Interrupting the second best moment of the game to deliver this weak sauce message is frankly a perfect crystallization of what this game is all about, and I wish it were better. A steady application of good fighting, with occasional backing up because the boss attacked you midway through your planning phase, takes us over the line. The iconography of global capital crumbles out of the sky, and the party is finally victorious. In terms of storytelling, there is not that much in the way of content to this chapter. The Templar side quest amounts to Adia being asked to succeed the throne and her saying, yeah, okay. Yokai is a retread of our used napkin slash lore bible. The main and side plots of the chapter feel like hasty justification for putting a series of colorful boss fights in the front of the player, which is a signal to me that this would be better done if it were either given far more elaboration or far less. I would frankly love it if one of the characters stared out the fourth wall and was like, hey listen, we ran out of plot, but we want you to do 12 more difficult boss fights because we worked really hard at making them cool and unique. Your typical JRPG will usually have this sort of secret power behind the antagonist thing to it anyway, and no final dungeon can be ordinary looking, so I get it. It was always going to end this way. The joy in plot lines like these are gradually over the course of transporting the player from Slime Tussler to God Slayer, making that ending make sense. And in Bravely Second, we never quite got there. To my mind, trying to provide any justifications for this can only weaken the impact of it. Rather than the culmination of anything, the whole deal with Altair, Vega, and Providence is the hasty wrap-up of the one plot thread out of the four that we didn't already address, and it's the weakest and worst of them to begin with, so I can't imagine it would ever have been engaging. In a macro sense, we have four characters and four plot threads. Yu is on a quest to rescue Agnes, and on the way uncovers some ugly family history and resolves to break down the old order. Magnolia is on a quest for vengeance against space monsters, and 
slays them. Adia learns how to be a ruler and ascends the throne. Tiz has nothing in particular to do, so he gets possessed by a ghost who does. A more satisfying resolution would involve all of these, but instead we get a bit of wrap up to the Tiz Altair thread and that's pretty much it. Explaining the origin of the balls doesn't actually involve or inform anything about Magnolia's plot thread. Okay, the monsters I've been training my whole life to kill come from a place. Cool. I can't imagine I would care to learn the particular taxonomy of a species of alligator while it is eating me alive. You has nothing to do with it at all, apart from, I guess, paying back Altair for the couple of times he helped us out. Idea revels in having the opportunity to punch a god, but it doesn't involve her plot thread. Actually, Idea is kind of the big loser of this because her entire plot is optional content. It's a shame because the aesthetics of the final boss fight suggest that they could have been a grand unifying theme, but just weren't up to snuff. While Anna taunts the party by saying she was born with purpose and humans aren't, this should have been a setup for a payoff later against Providence, where Yu expresses that this lack of purpose is our strength, our freedom to forge our own path by our own will, to establish a purchase or discard one, and try again. I am purposeless now, but that doesn't mean I am lost or aimless. I can recover. There is no hurt I can't live down, even if I can't see beyond it right now. My broken heart is greater than any disaster I have ever suffered, or any I will ever face. <sighs> okay, I'm projecting a lot, but I think all the bones of this sentiment are present even if the game assembles them with all the skill of early paleontologists inventing wrong dinosaurs. The courage to try again. But hey, maybe that message was too nuanced for this game, or maybe a large studio under the wing of a major publisher didn't want to push too hard for their evil god and boss to be the icon of global capital that only a disruption of hierarchy and humanist community forward message can destroy. Without Altair's soul to support him, Tiz dies and everybody's upset but me. He's had a rough time, just let the man rest for crying out loud. The game obviously does not have the balls to do that, so the adventurer walks up and says, Hey, I can help out. Give me the hourglass. She's Deneb, another celestial like Altair and Vega, all named for stars, you see. She's been the narrator the whole time, and all her chapter closing chit chat has been about Altair and Vega the whole time too. She takes the hourglass and goes back in time to give it to Tiz at the start of Bravely Default. In the intervening time, it can fill up with hopes and dreams or something, and then it's in Agnes's care and she runs up to pour the soul juice into Tiz's body so he can live again. The credits roll on the bottom screen while our characters get their send-offs, Magnolia prepares her ship to go back to the moon, Idea and Alternus stand in an empty room and make decisions, Yu chases after Magnolia's rocket but she wasn't in it, surprise, and they're in love. Agnes abdicates the papacy and goes to live with Tiz. I want to talk about this last one because it fucking sucks. So you want to tell me that the most powerful and important woman in the world, as her happy ending, quits her job to go marry a farmer and take his name, huh? Going with that one in 2016? Now, don't get me wrong. Agnes was a shut-in who expressed more fear at public speaking than at literal demons, so being a highly visible public figure was probably always a terror for her. And the surname Oblige is shared by Vestals as a kind of cast. It is consistent for her to be done with excitement and want a quiet life, but that consistency comes at the cost of some dog shit messaging about women's roles. It's not like Adia's send-off is much better even though she accepted leadership because she's just standing around. Like after saying, oh uh, yeah, she's a girl boss and she gets to rule now, they had no idea what that would look like. And no, I never expected this game to be earth quotes woke any more than I expect anything from a major publisher to be, but I always want to play games that are, no matter where they come from. So, 
I've been droning on about all the ways in which Bravely Second is shite, which is to say, it is shite in most of the ways you might choose to evaluate it. But I also think it is enjoyable in the sense that I had fun with it. And I think I'm not alone. Well, I think I'm not alone in this regard, anyway. Being profoundly a weirdo is a lifelong puzzle in figuring out how to get your various relationships to crumble as slowly as possible. What I'm saying is, apart from myself, who does this sort of game appeal to? Within the subset of all art that we define as the JRPG, I believe there are three main archetypes of JRPG liker, and a single person can be more than one of these at a time, or pick and choose a la carte from any of these qualities. Since I don't want anyone to feel too called out by this, I'm going to call these folks Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos. Clotho loves a good story, and JRPGs have a unique mindset with regard to storytelling, where the basic plot of all of them is the same. At level 1, the hero sets out with a bamboo pole to kill a slime, and then eventually at level 90, they use a legendary weapon to kill a god. But the ways we get them from this A to B are manifold and very, very weird. Clotho is in it for the story, seeing the hero squad beset by and overcome obstacles. Clotho also likes to feel a sense of personal involvement in driving that story forward. Random encounters and most boss fights are kinda light on narrative, so Clotho wants to skip as much of that as possible. Easy difficulty settings, running, and other means of bypassing encounters, and power rituals that obviate most combat are appealing to Clotho because it lets her get to the good stuff as fast as possible. Lachesis loves the puzzle of combat especially with turn-based JRPGs where the challenge is one of planning primarily with dexterity or social challenges either mitigated or minimized. Getting a tough nut to crack and then cracking it is what Lachesis loves best. Most JRPGs have something of a battle puzzle to them, and a wide degree of plasticity to coming up with novel solutions. Coming up with a plan and executing on it is very appealing to Lachesis, as are power rituals, especially if she can discover one for herself, but not to the point where the game reduces to a universal solvent, as Lachesis will tire of that quickly. Lachesis typically wants to play on the highest difficulty setting, and will do challenge runs after a first playthrough, or even on a first playthrough. This attitude is not necessarily about maximizing challenge, either. Sometimes you just want a long, slow burn of watching numbers go up. Atropos loves the aesthetics of JRPGs more than the games themselves. She retweets fan art of her favorite characters dressed in modern attire and drinking boba tea, and plans out elaborate cosplay for herself and others. She likes to watch and leave comments on fan theory videos that explore the game's... <sighs> lore. If she plays the game at all, she can be a sort of completionist, wanting more to explore the game's backstory and world-building details, as well as flavor text and visual design. Atropos loves soundtracks, too, and JRPGs tend to be full of bangers. She's keen on hearing familiar voice actors do their thing, and probably has a crush on Liam O'Brien, Gideon Emery, Tara Strong, or Erica Lindbeck. Also, if you do happen to be a werewolf, you should chase Erica through a forest. The plot is of secondary importance to Atropos, and she can take or leave combat, though she loves to watch her faves in action and will leave summon animations on. Again, if you're feeling called out by any of this, it just means there's a whole constellation of JRPGs out there for you to play and enjoy. Now, okay my fates, what do you all think? of Bravely Second. The story is pretty much dog shit, so I would imagine Clotho would bounce off of this pretty hard, but in case it for some reason appeals, there are excellent tools to mitigate combat available, so that part works. Lachesis, I think, has the most to get out of Bravely Second, as the puzzle of combat has several dimensions and Complete New Game Plus adds the possibility of all sorts of challenge runs. I have no guess as to what Atropos thinks of this, but I suppose there's a lot of dress-up available, and overall the game is gorgeous looking and has a good soundtrack behind it. Except that the voice lines got compressed to hell this time. I mean, listen to Idia in both games. 
my father, and Master Kami Izumi, they knew. They knew all along. Again with the croissants! Doesn't she care about anything but food? The compression is worse for higher pitched voices, so the girls suffer the most. This part baffled me. Bravely Second technically has just about everything you could want in a JRPG, but only in the most superficial way. I believe it is trying to appeal to absolutely everyone who likes this sort of thing, and goes out of its way to categorically include every bare bones element that an audience could want. It is weirdly risk averse as a design in this way, so okay, I'm going to try and give you the gourmet makes of Bravely Second. Here's how you make Bravely Second. Our audience likes X, so put in X, or Y which satisfies X. Repeat for all values of X. Example, we heard our audience likes fashion, so put in a bunch of cute outfits and even bonus garb. Done. Another example, we heard our audience likes Tails style party chat, so put that in our game. Done. What we've ended up with here is not a complete dish, so much as a pile of ingredients and tools on the kitchen counter. So, okay, forget what I think other people like about this game. What do I like about it? To begin with, of the fates, I am very much a lachesis. I get something out of pulling off dumb tricks in JRPGs that is satisfactory in a way that straight up puzzle games are not. Bravely Second has plenty of that. But again, once you figure out how to flush 16 actions worth of resources into damage, pretty much everything in the game is going to disappear before it can act. Just looking at various monster stat lines with a magnifying glass tips you off that these encounters were designed on a spreadsheet and never adjusted. The classic hit count, hit rate, base damage, defense formula tends toward wild swings because there are so many multipliers at play and it can be hard to find that sweet middle ground. But that's one thing that I actually like in a video game. The ability to bug fix or balance adjust from within the game itself. I like playing ROM hacks of my old favorites. I punched out Aria of Sorrow for God's sake. And Bravely Second is near infinitely customizable, so customize I shall. So if you want to know why I actually like Bravely Second whilst thinking it's pretty much garbage, that's why. At some point I realized that this video would not be complete without a bit more of a fleshed out mechanical rundown. Not an overview of all classes and abilities, mind you, but a peek under the hood of what makes all these bosses so tough, and why any given fight probably can be trivialized, but that comes at costs that make collaboration and learning a difficult and isolating task in itself. So we have a basic set of JRPG verbs. Each character plans an action, party and enemy actions execute in speed order with some variability, and resource and damage numbers and statuses change. This sort of thing is how any given Dragon Quest works going back 100 million years. Bravely games add the Brave and Default commands, which are built up from the PIP system of Four Warriors of Light. The default action boosts defenses and depending on how you look at it either adds or does not spend an action, leading to the character getting 1 BP. The Brave action lets a character plan an additional move to execute in one turn at the cost of 1 BP. So, level 0 combat is no different than classic games. Level 1 combat is blocking to build up turns and then spending extra turns after the block. Level 2 is flushing 16 actions into damage and never having to pay off the turn debt because that was enough to get the enemy out of the way. And this is where the pain point of collaboration comes in, because at some point in playing, everybody realizes that level 2 is good enough for any given encounter and stops thinking about it. Bravely Second has a lot of bosses and even random encounters that will dunk on you for presuming you can level 2 them and come out okay. Even just getting randomly outsped and having one of the four characters get whacked by a lucky crit shuts off four of those 16 actions, so do you think 75% damage and 4 turns of debt is going to work out? This brings us to level 3, which is approaching combat in an abstract manner, meaning whatever classes you like and whatever your approach, you need these things in this order. Damage output, damage mitigation, and recovery. If you can deal enough damage to get the kill, you go for it. 
This can of course suddenly not work if the enemy defaults and has either counterattacks or triggered mitigation, and those are rare but real. The more basic ask is just how much damage can you do and how much do you need to do? And the answers are not obvious on a first attempt, even if you look it up ahead of time. So my level 3 involves either the freelancer examine action or the magnifying glass item to reveal enemy health bars. Defense ignoring and default piercing abilities are often more effective than raw numbers at obtaining damage, so I value those highly. Mitigation involves HP, physical and magic defense, evasion, using default, the character being not physically present or incorporeal, and various other buffs, either from abilities or items. How much of that you need can vary from enemy to enemy and even turn over turn depending on the current state, and interacts with recovery to the tune of the more damage you mitigate, the less you need to recover. Recovery is any ability that restores status or hit points, and absolutely all of this comes at various costs. Abilities can cost HP, MP, BP, PEEG, a requirement of having executed a number of specific actions in the case of special moves, a cost of real-world time or money if you want to use SP, or even the cost of having randomly street passed with someone who uploaded a useful action to the cloud at some point. And in this, we begin to evaluate the calculus of combat. So the next time anyone tells you that these games are easy or you just deal damage, you have my permission to shove them into the nearest locker. My fondness for level 3 combat is how interactive it is across the game's various encounters. If your plan involves only physical damage, there are enemies with high defense, physical absorb, evasion, and thorns, or physical counters. If your output is magic, most of the same applies, but just different enemies. And now there are flavors involved, too. Similarly, for your mitigation, although the best mitigation, the default action, is also the most universal. Though if, for instance, your mitigation plan involves evasion, there are no miss moves. If it involves guts, that tends to collapse to multi-hit moves. If it involves being a ghost, then that kicks the can to the toughest non-ghost you still have standing. If your plan involves brave actions, the dread status can stop it, and on, and on. The particular genius of Bravely Second is the early jobs it gives you. Wizard has access to every flavor of magic damage, can spin it into whatever shapes are handy, and even enact it as physical damage. So. Everything I said about what kind of output would be the most useful? The wizard can do it all. You can even pivot on the fly if you learn more about the fight while you are in it, which always feels better than having to die and load from a save. Bishop has high defenses and good recovery. There are even passives that wizard and bishop have that play off each other in novel ways. That some of the first options you get are some of the most versatile is pretty slick, and they only get more versatile as you rank them up. I much prefer this to the opposite style, where you sweat out combat for hours figuring out what you're critically lacking and then fall in love with the character who finally joins your party who can do that thing, though that's more a tonal choice than a technical one. The classes of Bravely Second add up to a huge sandbox, with enough options to be overwhelming. There's one particular pinch point in this that I want to address. Remember when I said I was still haunted by the Cursed Land, where every encounter is a max level ball? The first time I got there, I had saved after that happened. I figured out how to move on to the good loop and continue with the plot, but the bosses there made it clear that I needed more levels, and if I wanted to change up my plan, I needed different jobs. But in a good loop, all the world monsters have been replaced with far larger ones, so I couldn't reliably chain battle, and even surviving one regular battle required a lot of time and resources. I had effectively softlocked myself. I needed numbers, and my choices were between impossible superbosses and torturous next world monsters, so I had to pump the brakes on going forward, reload, and do a bad loop just so I could access my reliable chain battles again which was tedious and momentum shattering, which is why I hope it wasn't intentional. But given the scale of numbers involved and the fact that Anya says it happened over and over and over again, 
I'm pretty sure it was. The problem with copying your previous work so directly is that you copy the mistakes too. The fact that you have to aggressively do the wrong thing to get the good ending was not a feature worth making a staple of the series. Even so, having come to the conclusion that my best path forward was to restore from an earlier save is part of why that cursed land still haunts me. Did I make the right choice? Could I have kept the boss that was stonewalling me? I don't know the answer to that. But while I consider the question, I hear childish voices harmonizing, and I envision silhouetted modern landscapes surreally mishmashed. And it's a unique and affecting feeling. I love being this cursed. So, Bravely Default 2 has come out. In an interview about it, Leading up to the release, Tomoya Asano, producer and writer for Bravely Second, first apologized. Asano-san, along with Tsuki Tsukishima and Shinji Takahashi, are the listed writers for Bravely Second. Bravely Default had No Takahayashi and Keiichi Ajiro, and I had to get some of this information from Wikipedia because the games themselves don't list a writer credit. I know a lot of what I experienced is colored by localization and even acting, so who knows how much of the original vision made it from them to me. It's tough to figure out who should take responsibility for this pile. For some of these folks, I couldn't even find a wider set of games they worked on. And you try looking up the name Shinji Takahashi sometime. Seeing different writers for the two games doesn't surprise me, and may serve to explain why so many of the cameo characters are repurposed, or why there was a tonal shift that expunged some of the darker elements. What it doesn't explain is why the plot is an incoherent tangle of threads. This non-specific nothing of an apology is at least consistent with the writing style of Bravely Second. It leaves me confident that Bravely Default 2 will be a video game, and makes me think one of the goals is to erase Bravely Second from existence, to make it something of a lost sequel. And I get it, it's a mammalian instinct to bury your turds. I consider it a point of human pride to resist that urge. I'm going to make mistakes. Even the same mistakes. Again and again. Some of them are built into me for the cursed being that I am. But I can mitigate and I can recover. Away forever with milquetoast, nonspecific, craven mistakes. Now is the time for fulgent, clarion, bold mistakes. You have an ass, and you're going to show it, so you may as well take pride in it. There is definitely an audience for the throwback JRPG, and in case you're a part of it, you should check out Space Funeral, Lisa, Jimmy and the Pulsating Mass, Weird and Unfortunate Things Are Happening, Bug Fables, Ickenfell, Seventh Dragon 3, and Darkest Dungeon. I can recommend all of these for different tastes and reasons. Getting the Car Loser is coming out soon, and that looks pretty dope. There's good food out there for this appetite. You don't need to keep eating junk. And neither do I. Okay, I was trying to figure out if there was anything I missed in reviewing this, and I think there was. There was one thing that I didn't talk about. It's in this scene where you plunges to his death and Magnolia jumps after him. Okay, so they didn't want you to get an upskirt of Magnolia as she was plummeting, so they put in this rock and it just sweeps in from the side, like right there. <laughs> Take that, teens. <laughs> Try to get horny at our video game, will ya? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>